Welcome back, everybody, to the second uh, uh, session of the uh, Blockchain Tech Fest. The festival will continue. Uh, this is what Arun and the Indian uh, uh, community, and we have the African chapter here as well today, have put together, and Kamlesh and others. Um, it was a, a great event last week, and this week we've got even more uh, contributors and maintainers. Uh, from uh, We've got something from Hyperledger Labs, um, which you know, which actually Bath, I've heard a lot about, it's like a lot of, you know, a lot of interest in Bath. We've had a few other events and, and a lot of interest there. Caliper, um, which is a benchmarking tool, Explorer, and of course we have uh, Fabric. So uh, yet again, I think the message I'm gonna give to everybody is, you know, enjoy this. This is a great, thank you uh, to the community for pulling this, this, putting this together. Please do get involved. Uh, all these projects are looking for uh, people to help uh, in contribution. Uh, this is all about developing this uh, ecosystem together for all the benefit of everybody here. Uh, so please uh, uh, do get involved. And uh, once again, welcome back. And now I think I'm just going to hand over to you, Arun, today to take this on. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. And we welcome we'll, we welcome the community across Asia Pacific and Europe for joining us today. Good morning and good afternoon or good evening to you. So up first in today's session, we have Saunak and Priyanka joining us from Accenture. And then they're going to speak about blockchain automation framework. And this is one of the project which has been gaining traction within Hyperledger Labs. And um, it's also like recently called out. Many people are describing that blockchain automation framework is defining the way we deploy a production grade blockchain networks for, for our use cases. So I'll hand it over to Saunak and Priyanka. Thank you. Thanks, Arun. Thanks, Julian. Uh, welcome, everyone, again. Uh, I know it's uh, mid-afternoon, uh, mid, uh, you know, post lunch time for India. And uh, I hope we don't uh, really bore you with a lot of details, but we keep the talk very relevant. Um, and uh, yeah, please enjoy the session. So. I'll share my screen. Uh, please let me know once you can see and we will get going. Okay. Okay, so uh, the first thing that, you know, uh, so this is the agenda and uh, we will give you a labs intro because the last time we spoke, we understood that a lot of uh, the people who are active members in Hyperledger uh, community, do, they do, really do not understand what exactly is the concept of labs, right? So we'll cover a little bit on uh, what does it mean that BAF or blockchain automation framework is part of Hyperledger labs. Um, you know, what is the problem statement? Why did we really create uh, uh, such a product? Why, why did we really want to work on something like this? It's architecture. And then how are we using it to consistently deploy production grade networks? Uh, you know, uh, I would say agnostic of the distributed ledger technology you're using. So uh, if I just choose the Hyperledger umbrella, uh, Hyperledger Fabric, Indie or Besu, so how does it use the same framework uh, to deploy different kinds of DLT networks? Um, the next part is, you know, how far have we progressed, but there is a lot more to do and how can you engage with us for that uh, and Q&A and, you know, to get how to get involved. So with that, um, you know, you can just uh, scan this QR code if you're really interested with your phone and it will take you to um, the Hyperledger Labs detail link. But just to give you an introduction, uh, the qualified projects that you see, um, they really require a lot of paperwork, uh, technical steering committees, review, uh, and, and, and a legal framework approval uh, to become qualified projects. So Hyperledger came with this idea that why don't we introduce a labs where uh, projects that are still a little early to go into uh, and become a qualified project can actually start working their way to become a qualified project. And with that idea, uh, you know, um, the Hyperledger labs has a lot of, uh, you know, incubatory projects, if I can call them. Um, BAF being one of them. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, I think we open source last year in 2019, around September, October timeframe. And uh, it, it has been one year since we have uh, been in labs, we have got a light, lot of guidance and hence, you know, uh, we now strive to become a qualified project. 
Okay, so um, with that, just to uh, you know, show exactly where do we uh, stand. Uh, uh, this is a view of the Hyperledger Greenhouse, uh, the DLTs, the libraries, the tools. And on the right side, uh, you know, bottom, you see Hyperledger Labs, and that's where blockchain automation framework lies. So again, a QR code that will take you just to our, you know, GitHub link. Um, uh, I'll just pause here for 10 seconds if anybody really wants to see while I talk on what exactly it is. If you have not heard uh, about it before, please do that. Okay. So now I'll just, you know, tell you a little bit of story. So Accenture really uh, started working um, on blockchain uh, quite early, I would say, way back in 2015, 16, um, it, it, even before that in our labs. And then slowly we had a lot of client conversations and we then progressed to a stage uh, in 2017, 18, where we started doing POCs or implementations with the client. Some of the common challenges that we saw was, you know, that we have done with POC, the client is really happy, but when we need to scale, we have to redo the entire thing again because there are a lot of architectural components that you know, we really don't uh, think about or we don't uh, give a lot of attention to when we want to um, uh, do a, a quick POC, but when we have to go and scale it to production, those considerations make um, a, 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 a solution you know, of, of literally of no use. Um, so for example, security, how, how our certificates are uh, stored, how credentials are exchanged are, are some of the components that you, know, you might not be thinking about in POC, but in production, it becomes uh, very important. Um, so the second thing was the network itself is the crux of blockchain or DLT technology. And it is, I mean, let's be frank, it's not easy, right? Uh, the first trouble that we have seen developers talk about that it's really complex, how to deploy a network. There are a lot of dependencies. Uh, this service has to be up or that service has to be up. Uh, the configuration has to be done properly. So these were some common you know, murmurs that we used to hear from all our developers that we are spending a lot of time in, in, in network deployment rather than our own chain code development or application development. So. So with that in mind, we thought, why don't we create a bridge? Uh, you know, which kinds of uh, implements, what we call is a distributed ledger technology reference architecture. So it builds upon some uh, principles and patterns. Uh, it should be designed for being production ready. So it, it's not something, you know, that you would want to use if you want to just showcase uh, the power of blockchain. It's something that you, you would need when you really want to build something production worthy. Uh, it, it should support you know, multi-company uh, or multi-organization -organi concept because we all by now know that blockchain or DLT is not a single player uh, technology. It has to solve an ecosystem problem or multiple partners problem. Uh, so how do we really create a technology which would by default support that kind of uh, uh, business uh, um, you know, um, network? Uh, the next thing was we also did not want it to be logged with a single kind of cloud provider or infrastructure. We wanted to keep it open. So if, if a particular client already has uh, you know, is an AWS Amazon shop or it's an, is a Microsoft shop and they do, really do not want to change their cloud uh, infra, then we, we didn't want to force uh, a single one. Hence, we have kept it infra independent. And the second thing is it's obviously open source, which you all by now know. So, so, so that's the concept that we thought. And with that, uh, you know, what we have built is, uh, is very simple. So there's a single file, which we call as net, uh, you know, network.yaml file. And all your network details, um, you know, what's the platform of your choice? When I say platform, is the D it's a DLT platform, uh, whether it's Fabric, it's Indy, it's Besu, or, or the others, because we already we have also implemented it for Corda, Corda Enterprise, and Quorum. So you specify the platform, so your application now becomes independent, right? You can do a little bit of plug and play. Um, so uh, you know, you choose your platform, you choose your consensus. You choose the kind of cloud infra, environment details, your ports, your, um, you know, so all those details, um, external DNSs, et cetera, they go in this single file. And the framework um, 
which uses some key components. So for example, Kubernetes is a uh, crux. Um, you know, Shonak will be covering these uh, in detail, but we used Kubernetes because it, it uh, the managed EKS on a cloud solves a lot of questions on high availability, disaster recovery, which we really do not have to then design uh, in, in a custom way, but those get uh, very deeply embedded in our architecture. Hence, uh, you know, Kubernetes is, is the crux. Um, so it just takes that single file and brings up a network for you. That's it. So we don't call it uh, one touch deployment, but we say it one step deployment. So we don't have a fancy UI. It's, it's all through, you know, command lines uh, because we, we wanted to build it up for technical people, for developers and uh, uh, architects. So there's, there's no user interface. You will have to work on this configuration file as it stands now. Uh, but just using that one single file, we can uh, bring up a network. So a little bit on what is supported right now. Uh, you know, uh, we had, uh, we, we are on our 0.6 release right now. And uh, um, so we have our three core enterprise, uh, the version Besu 1.4.4, the fabric version 2.0. Uh, I think we, we recently did a re release to have 2.2 as well, right, Shanak? Yep. So oh, two point two is uh, is still in uh, in a feature. It's a feature branch okay, there. If you, okay. someone wants to explore, they can do it. It's not merged to the mask okay. um, developer okay. must. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, but yeah, you can um, see the code if you want uh, two point two as well. So yeah. So our three quarter version four point four indie and quorum. So so that's the uh, you know uh, BAF support matrix which we have for each of these platforms. Uh, now a little bit, um, you know, on uh, when I say that it just takes a single file uh, and, and brings up a network, what are the components that we have used um, to, to bring up the network, right? So it uses Ansible. Uh, it, use, it uses mainly, you know, the Ansible playbooks. So we use it like an automation tool. Uh, not really uh, like a configuration management uh, software, which when you Google to Ansible, you will see that it is mostly used as a configuration management system, but we, we, are, being, we are using it primarily as, as an automation tool, right? And it uses Helm charts. So, so we are using Helm, which again is a package manager. Uh, we are using Kubernetes for you know, orchestrating all the uh, workloads and services. We are using GitOps and Flux. So one interesting thing here is that, you know, once you have deployed the network and if the network goes through any change, then um, uh, uh, our network.yaml uh, is uh, uh, in the repository and, uh, you know, GitOps, uh, GitOps uh, Flux, it's kind of uh, binded to it, it's listening to it. And if any change happens uh, in the network.yaml, it senses it and redeploys the network. Hence the, the, the continuous deployment theme is very easily achieved using uh, GitOps and Flux. Uh, we are using HashiCorp Vault, uh, but you know we have also implemented it for uh, some clients that who did not really want a HashiCorp Vault, but they wanted, for example, Azure Key Vault. So with a, a little change, you can. Um, I wouldn't say it's completely pluggable, but it's it's doable. So it's manageable to change the vault. Um, and obviously, as uh, I've mentioned, that it can be used on any cloud uh, service. So uh, with that, before I hand it over to Shanak uh, for a little bit of yeah. more detailing. Uh, any Thanks, questions? Priyanka. Yeah, I think there is a question if my fabric peers, I'm answering live. So uh, if I need my fabric peers to have users in Indy, does it support this kind of multi-chain architecture? Uh, the answer is, uh, it is up to you to deploy Fabric and uh, deploy Indie and uh, create that uh, multi-chain uh, or uh, the integration between that. Uh, what BAF will do is uh, give you that option to use the same tool uh, to deploy your Fabric and deploy your Indie network. Uh, because again, uh, BAF is not a uh, a solution. It is uh, a automation tool which will create, uh, which will make your solutioning easier, uh, or the deployment of the 
of both any of the networks uh, that we support uh, easier. Okay, yeah, so as uh, as we go back, go, I mean, Bianca, if you go back, I just uh, want to dwell on, on that slide on the number of tools that we are using. Yeah, so we uh, just to uh, clarify uh, that we are also using HashiCorp Vault, which is our uh, uh, secret storage, certificate storage uh, solution. Uh, we have chosen HashiCorp Vault because, again, we want to be uh, cloud agnostic. So we are not using any uh, AWS KMS or Azure Key Vault, which, which ties you to the uh, cloud. Uh, HashiCorp Vault has uh, its own integration. It's more like how we are using Kubernetes to achieve that cloud agnosticity. Uh, so HashiCorp Vault can be deployed on any cloud provider and you can integrate it with the say KMS or Key Vault um, on with the HashiCorp Vault as well as the Google uh, Cloud. Uh, so that's how we have in, uh, re received that, and that's why uh, we that's how we claim to be uh, any cloud, uh, including on-prem. Uh, of course, we, we in our day-to-day -day development, we do not uh, deploy on all the cloud platforms that are available because it is cost prohibitive. Uh, so we, we generally test on AWS, um, but uh, we have uh, tested and have. Uh, done projects on uh, Azure and uh, Google Cloud as well. Right. Okay. So now going back, uh, going to the uh, more on on the architect or not really the architecture. The how we have achieved this, how uh, BAF internally works, is of course we everything on BAF is uh, to be on on Kubernetes. So hence, all the applications, uh, all the um, uh, platforms, which is the uh, DLT platforms, uh, must have. Uh, uh, container support, so must have their proper Docker images. Like uh, I mean, Fabric, uh, Besu, and Indy, all of them are uh, container native, anyways. Like we we run them always on container, so that's what uh, what's one uh, very good thing about uh, our Hyperledger, Fabric, all these tools. So we all all have the images, the uh, Docker containers, basically Fabric ordered, and all that is all taken from official. Fabric releases, we don't uh, rebuild them in any way. Uh, and then uh, our main uh, code is, is the Ansible, as, as Priyanka said, is the automation. It's not really the configuration management because Ansible is not doing, uh, it's not deploying on the Kubernetes cluster or on any machine. Uh, first of all, there is no, uh, it's always deploys on a cluster, so it doesn't deploy. Of course, your cluster is running on some virtual machines. Uh, but Ansible doesn't uh, control them. So Ansible is more of an automation, it's more of a templating tool. Uh, that's how we have used it. So, uh, we, and as we see that Ansible, we have different playbooks and ro roles. Uh, I think people who are uh, familiar with Ansible will understand uh, that, uh, I mean, playbooks are basically, you know, the stepwise uh, a sequence of steps that you will perform. And then the roles are basically your functions, which you call from playbooks. So these are the playbooks or roles we have, like which can install a chain code, we can create certificates, we can create channels, we can create uh, the, we can join a channel orderers, or we can also do single cluster uh, network or multiple cluster uh, network. And then uh, on the, then that creates uh, the, the, I mean, the Helm charts also are also provided. So from BAF point of view, the Helm charts are also available open source, uh, you know, we are trying to get like a Helm repository uh, so that you can use just the Helm charts, but right now also you can you can take the Helm charts and use it in your own way. You don't have to use Ansible uh, to, uh, to uh, deploy the network. So also again, our Helm charts, we all have these join channel charts, uh, update chain code charts, creating of raft or Kafka orderer charts, uh, the member MSP creation, then peer nodes or CLIs, all those charts are available. So what Ansible does is when the developer, the developer gives that one single configuration file and Ansible is going to read the configuration file and create the Helm value files, uh, which will then uh, be deployed uh, onto Kubernetes using Flux. So Flux gives us the continuous deployment as Priyanka said uh, so it will uh, create uh, the multiple uh, 
uh, all the all the deployments in a sequence as we are running uh, running in. So the, so the first time you execute the playbook, of course, it will wait for things to happen, like it will wait for orderer to come up and then peers will come up and then the installation will happen and all that. But once your network is set up, uh, then all you need to do if you want to change little bit of things like you just want to update the fabric peer uh, uh, image. So in that case, you will only do a check in to uh, the GitOps, the Git repo with the updated uh, Helm value file, and that will be deployed automatically. Okay, and next one, or do we want to take some questions on Fabric specifically? So, uh, Shanak, one or two questions that were from Kartike, uh, I've answered, but yeah, please. Uh, is whether two peers can be on two different cloud providers. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, it can be as long as you have, uh, see, uh, as uh, I'll show you the network YAML as well. So you can, uh, all organizations actually can be deployed and we encourage people to deploy different organizations in different Kubernetes clusters and different cloud providers. Yes. And the other one, um, I mean, I'll, I'll answer this maybe, so yeah, I, I think we can go ahead and I'll answer these questions. Uh, okay, so if you go to the next yeah. slide, please. So that's uh, I'll do that, yeah. Uh, the, yeah, so that's uh, on the indie side. I mean, it is more or less same and I'll, I'll actually go into how to share my screen and show the network YAML so it is clearer. Uh, so yeah, so indie again, uh, similar uh, similar concept. Uh, the only thing is that uh, the indie uh, nodes, uh, CLIs, key management, the containers are built by us uh, because we use the instructions from the indie Hyperledger indie um, uh, documents to how to create those containers uh, because we again, as I said, BAF deploys everything on Kubernetes. Mm, and then, uh, then again, we have the similar uh, Ansible uh, roles and playbooks, which will do the D DID management, uh, credential definition, uh, creation, schema definition, you know, crypto generation, and and uh, the actual node uh, in the node setup, and then single cluster or multiple cluster. Uh, the only complexity with Indy is that uh, it doesn't, uh, it needs uh, static IPs uh, because Indy by design doesn't work on, on uh, DNS names because DNS names are uh, going to change and it, it it's, that's how Indy is designed, right? So uh, all our, uh, for Indy, we need, uh, when you deploy Indy, you must have a few uh, static IPs uh, in your account, in your cloud account, whatever it is. And uh, uh, from the uh, from the Helm charts, uh, yeah, we have the gen the key management uh, group of charts. Then we have the cluster management group of charts, and also the organization where you can update the credential or add a DID document. And uh, yeah, so the Genesis file and all that. And again, it's, it's very simple because Genesis gets stored into. Uh, our uh, the vault as well. So if you want to share, uh, of course, someone who has access to the vault, Hashikov vault, they can share because uh, for in the you know, nodes to connect, you need to share the schemas and also all that information is easily available uh, when we deploy in the. Okay. So Shanak, one question, uh, if you can answer live. Uh, yeah. It's how can we enable TLS on peer node deployed on Kubernetes? Uh, all, all our peer nodes are TLS enabled. Uh, so we, we don't, uh, everything in BAF, uh, be it uh, Corda or uh, Quorum or, or Besu or, or, um, or uh, Fabric, uh, wherever the TLS options are there, all of them are already TLS enabled. So we, we strictly enforce uh, TLS 1.2 as well. So uh, that's one of the Accenture policies. We cannot use 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, so all uh, anything below 1.2 is, is forbidden. So um, all, all the communication is 1.2. And uh, the peer nodes uh, in our uh, network, when you create using BAF, it is uh, DLS enabled by default. So I don't know if uh, that answers your question, Gorang, because his question was, how can we enable DLS? So is there some something that- I mean, it is already share? enabled. So uh, if you check the code as well, uh, it is always DLS enabled and our chain codes as well are, uh, 
uh, or uh, when you dip install or deploy a create a channel, it always uses the certificates. Okay, so uh, Shanak, at this point, do you want to go uh, and uh, just cover this for Besu as well, or do you want yeah, to actually? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, yeah, let's cover this for Besu. Then I'll I'll go back and. Uh, uh, depending on the questions, uh, maybe or the interest. Yeah, so Besu is much more simpler, uh, as I guess uh, yeah, we'll we'll share uh, in the next. I mean, in, in the uh, later that uh, we need more contributors, especially for Besu, uh, because um, yeah. So Besu, we have uh, the the we have just used one one uh, uh, IBFT consensus as one and one Orion uh, as the private uh, transaction manager. Uh, so that's all we have. And it's much simpler because Bisu or Quorum by default is, is not as complicated as, as um, Fabric or Corda. Uh, so we, we have the crypto generation, uh, transaction managers, and, and again, just to reiterate, uh, all transaction managers and everything is, is using TLS. Uh, there is no, even though they are uh, deployed uh, at, uh, within the same uh, uh, same cluster, and uh, that yeah. So again, uh, we are not using, we have not integrated say PostgreSQL DB or any uh, any other DB. We are still using the file system DB for uh, Besu. So, but the concept is similar. I mean, that's how we have tried. So, basically, if if you are working, if you are using BAF uh, for uh, Fabric, and then uh, tomorrow you want to also try out Besu, then it is very easy because the concepts are exactly the same. So you don't have to learn a new new lang new technology or something. Uh, I mean, you just have to learn. Uh, you have you know already how the Ansible and the Helm charts work, right? So it's almost similar to how Terraform operates. Uh, so Terraform is the same tool you use for both all the all other all the supported cloud providers. But then of course you have to rewrite some code uh, for different uh, cloud providers. But you don't have to read that read and uh, I mean re learn any new technology. So that's the same concept. So if you're using uh, base, base, if you're going to use base two later, uh, it's, it's uh, all exactly the same con configuration file. I mean, of course, the value contents of the configuration file will be different as we'll see now, uh, but, uh, but the concept is similar or the configurations that you put in them is, is quite similar. Thanks, Shonak. So we do not have any open Q&A, um, yeah. but I think it will be good to take uh, folks through network.yaml to, um, yeah. to, okay. So I'll stop sharing then, Shonak. Yeah, let me share. So yeah, please feel free to uh, ask any questions in the Q&A uh, section. Right, okay. Hope you can see, or is it too dark? <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is, uh, so this is, uh, we have uh, many uh, network YAMLs as you can, if you, some people, folks have already gone to our uh, code repository. So uh, I'll show you how the repository is generally uh, organized. It's uh, on the main uh, BAF repo, we have these uh, platforms and inside platforms, we have all the platforms, uh, I mean, all the supported platforms. <laughs> uh, so under them, uh, on, the, on there will be a file folder called configuration which contains hey, all Shonak, the... uh, sorry to stop you but uh, there's a request to increase the font a bit okay so if you can zoom it just see if a control plus works yeah it does work okay yeah i think this is good okay let me close this don't need the yeah uh so you have under configuration, you have samples and in samples, you have different samples uh, for uh, all the play, like the network YAML samples, not the playbook samples. And uh, so I'll just go through this uh, fabric raft sample. Uh, again, it's almost similar. You will have uh, the network and, and uh, then uh, that's where you type fabric and then the version uh, we also support 200, but uh, for, uh, I think 200 had, we did not create the node, um, the channel 
or the chain code uh, life cycle. So it creates a few problems in our application, which is a supply chain application that is that comes free with, with uh, BAF. Uh, but uh, that's why we are migrating directly to 2.2. So you'll see 2.2 here uh, in soon. And then we have an environment section. So this is more <coughs> for uh, uh, your for generally for developer environment when you are running multiple uh, tests in in the multiple environments in the same but you will not always use this if you are deploying it for production uh, it will be just a type production and then for pro we have proxy now uh, we only use ha proxy for uh, fabric uh, for everything else we use ambassador uh, like like here uh, so this is indi and this is vesu uh, why we used AMBA HA proxy was for the TLS uh, pass through, SSL pass through, uh, because our, as I said, our fabric network itself is TLS enabled. Uh, so it was, uh, if we are using Ambassador, uh, the TLS packets were opened at Ambassador, and uh, Ambassador was, it was quite complicated to configure pass through. I think they have done it now, but we have not, we didn't have the time to upgrade the Ambassador. So uh, we continued with HA proxy, which is uh, uh, you very easy to uh, do SSL pass through. So all the uh, it, HA proxy the, at the proxy, we don't open the packets. It just passes through to the peers or the orderer and the orderer opens the packets. And hence this is not valid for um, just there for completion. And we have the retry count and external DNS. So again, these are uh, your um, for the cluster so if your cluster is a bit slow you can do because our uh, when the playbook runs uh, it waits for events to happen so basically it will wait for 20 times before the event to happen if it does not happen within 20 times of course then there is something wrong and you can uh, we delete uh, i mean it fails the playbook will fail then you have the Docker section uh, here again, it's more, uh, you don't generally need it if you're using all Docker Hub images, uh, but of course, if you have a private uh, Docker Hub, uh, Docker repo, then this will be beneficial because this is how we create the Kubernetes secret to download images. Then you have the orderer section where you define the orderers. Uh, the orderer section is common because all the, um, all the uh, chan, uh, all the other peers, non-order, the peer organizations will need the certificates because they are all TLS uh, to, to connect to the orderer and hence the orderer section is common. And then you can define channels here. And I saw there was a question of multiple channels. So yes, you can define multiple channels in this section. Uh, in this example, we have one channel and you have all the participants organizations of that channel and out of them organizations uh, only one will be creator and the others will be uh, joiner uh, or the creator organization will actually create the channel because we as we know that uh, the channel creation only needs to happen for one organization and then the genesis name as well uh, you, we can provide it here Okay, and then then comes the organization part. Uh, so as um, we said, we we uh, create. Uh, uh, it, they, I mean, uh, BAF is designed for uh, multi-party systems, so um, it has to. It is assumed that each uh, the, there will be different people, different organizations joining the consortium and joining the blockchain network. And hence we have different, uh, all these separate of separation. So not, not except the orderer section and the channel sections, of course, where you have the common things, right? Like, you know, you have to know the channel name that you are going to join and you, you have to get the orderer certificates, the public certificates for the orderers, but all other organizations are independent. So, which means that if I am the example that I'm saying is that if you are running uh, one organization in Azure, in Azure and another organization AWS, so you will only have that organization in your uh, network YAML. And uh, so this first one is the orderer type of organization. Uh, so here, uh, these are common themes. I think you can go and read and like uh, all them not draining on this one, but the important parts are the Kubernetes and vault sections. So that's where uh, you are specifying a different Kubernetes cluster. You can, because each organization has their own K test section. So that means you can deploy on multiple Kubernetes clusters from the same network.yaml if you have access to both the Kubernetes. 
same as vault each organization should have their own vault uh, so they would have a different vault address and a vault root token uh, root tokens are uh, generally uh, will i mean when you run the run the i mean this is a very operator uh, node uh, operator framework so it's not for general you know developers to run this because you will only generally run it once when you are doing uh, production test environment deployment right uh, but even then uh, the vault root token as well as you know the aws access keys and all may be visible in the log so we'll we'll always suggest that once you have deployed the um, component you should change the access key as well as change the root token. And then we have the GitOps ops section. Uh, so this is where uh, the Git ops part, which is basically our operations via Git, Git uh, all, all uh, the new files that was created during the deployment process will be checked in in this, this folder, uh, whatever path you've given, and it will be checked in in this uh, Git repository. And then the services part, yeah. So for orderers, you will have uh, the CA service and then a consensus and then the actual orderer definition. So that's all the orderer organization has. And then in, in a, this is another, this is a peer organization. So in which case everything else is, uh, the, these parts are same, the common parts, but on the services point of view, the peers, uh, the, they are hosting a CA as well as just peers. And you can have multiple peers in it. So this example is a raft on. So uh, you can see we have three raft orderers. Uh, and uh, for for the peer, uh, we have, uh, you, can, you know, we, we can do an anchor peer definition because ideally, at least one anchor peer should be there, uh, right? Um, but it can be uh, more, uh, uh, you can have multiple anchor peers in your uh, organization as well. Do you have Ishanak. the CLI option now? Sorry. So, yeah. sorry, in the interest of time, um, yeah. do you, yeah, I don't know if you want to just cover something. Yeah, I think I'll just, yeah, cover that. So, I mean, again, these are all documented. I don't have to go through all of them each of the time. So, uh, just going through, going, showing the similarities. I mean, because as I was saying that it is uh, for Indy and Besu, also exactly same uh, format, uh, you have an environment and you can define extra ports that you want to use for, in case of ambassador, this one is valid if you want to deploy, because ambassador is acting as your general e API gateway uh, for the Kubernetes cluster. So you may want to uh, configure the ambassador with multiple other ports as well, which is possible. And, so uh, somebody wants to see uh, the running, please show us running the terminal commands that consumes this YAML. So uh, site.yaml okay. playbook uh, consumes this, uh, what's it, right? Uh, okay, so that's, I mean, yeah, so that's how it is in, I mean, it's all <laughs> documented. I don't know if that was a part of this uh, demo because we, we haven't planned an actual uh, running of a network in this uh, today. So Watsil and for everybody else, um, today we just wanted to take you through the components and uh, you know um, how th this has been architected. Uh, there's another session coming up, I hope Arun confirms, yeah. on 21st November, where we plan to show you a 15 minute demo for each of these platforms. So please, you know, look out for the announcement. And if you really want to see how things, you know, how a network gets deployed, uh, please, uh, you know, log in on that particular day as well. Uh, Shanak, one more question is um, for a multi-organization setup, how each org gets connected to each other if they use their own separate cloud infra? Is there an, any invitation process involved for bringing everyone on same network? Uh, so uh, no, so you will have to, uh, so basically when uh, multiple organizations are deployed on, uh, there's no invitation point. Uh, so you, when you deploy, uh, you will be just uh, sharing, uh, you, they will have a public uh, way to public uh, endpoint to reach, which is, which is defined by this external org suffix. So all you are, if you're going to reach a peer, you have to have the address of the peer, which will be something dot org to ambassador dot blockchain cloud poc dot com. This is just an example. Um, and then you will have to use uh, the actual uh, name, the node name, which is defined by this subject to reach uh, that particular organization. So it's all via the public uh, internet. 
So, so long as you know these, the, the address and the name of the subject, uh, you can reach each other. Okay, so, um, yeah, Shanak, do you want to allow me to share the screen and just yeah, go, and through... Go, go through the rest of the stuff? Because yes. there are a lot of questions already coming on, you know, what is on the same thing? Yeah, 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 sure. Okay, I'll share my screen again. Uh, so what we are present to, presenting to you now will cover, you know, what we are supporting, what we have already built or implemented, and what we really need your help, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of community help um, to, you know, keep doing it with the same vigor. So let me go to the next one. Yes. Shanak. To you. Yeah, sure. So on uh, on the implementations that we have already done, which is on the on the left hand side of your screen, we we do have multi cluster node deployment for Fabric. We support one four four and uh, two point two point zero, which is uh, in the feature branch. Uh, just to remind you can I mean the feature branch is also public. You can get a pull from the feature branch if you want to really use it. Um, and uh, then we have the multi cluster setup. Uh, supporting Kafka for 4.44 and Raft. Uh, we have not tested. I mean, we did test for 2.0.0, the Kafka one, but 2.2 2 .2 is, is still, as I said, is still in progress. Uh, the credentials and uh, certificate management are involved. Uh, you know, you can operate a creation of peer CLIs, as I show that you can enable CLI in, in when you create the peer and you can choose that you not all your peers have a CLI, you can have only one CLI. Uh, then you can do, we can do addition of peers uh, on an existing organization as well as addition of peer, a whole new organization to an existing network. Of course, adding a whole new organization to an existing network is more, is more process intensive, like it, it uh, the playbook will be quite big. And all of those playbooks are there and the documentation is also available. You can add an orderer, which is of course for raft. Uh, you can add channels you can uh, remove an organization. So removal of organization is, uh, I don't think it's live yet because it's uh, in, in this sprint. We, as we know, we we run our in uh, our uh, backlog as a two week sprint. We are, uh, we do uh, quite strict <laughs> scrum. So it's two week sprint and, but all the planning and everything is open. We have a planning on Monday. If you guys are interested to join, like what are the things that are happening right now? And uh, we do have the integration with the supply chain application, ref application. Uh, so that's that's already there. In the roadmap, we have this oh, the multiple organization orderer that is not yet implemented. So these are the ones on the left hand side is where we need community help on, and that's why we want your contributions. Uh, we have seen quite uh, some contributions uh, already, and it's very encouraging. Um, so these are the ones that are open uh, stories or open issues, uh, which uh, anyone can take up. So you can do step supporting standalone couch TV images, and then uh, upgrading uh, that one. Yeah, so 1.4, say eight or something. So because we would like to maintain 1.4.x and 2.2.x. Uh, so so if someone does doesn't, is it will be quite easy actually just to test that 1.4.8 works. Actually, it's not. I don't think there is any code change needed. Uh, test and document of multi-chain code. Yeah, so multiple chain code deployment we have not tested yet because our application is very application specific. Uh, so, and our application only has one chain code. And of course, removal of channels or deactivation of channels. Those are the things that are not supported right now. And if I can add something here, we also want to know, you know, if you are working with yeah. clients or customers, what are they asking for, right? Because we would want to develop what is being demanded. Uh, we would want to understand, uh, get to hear from you. So, so please connect if you have something in mind. Please request for a feature. Uh, um, you know, if you feel that we haven't built something which uh, is required. Yeah, 
And there is a question in case of adding a new or do you need do we need access to their vault and control plan? Yeah, the answer is yes, <laughs> because otherwise anyone can directly add uh, organizing uh, add uh, the organization uh, to uh, to the uh, to like that. So basically, when you add an organization, you will have to. I say, for example, take for example any example of uh, supply chain. So I am a supplier, and I want to join an existing uh, network. So I'll have to host my own vault, and I'll have to host my old Kubernetes cluster, own Kubernetes cluster, and then I will request to the consensus that please provide me your certificates uh, to join the orders. And then, of course, uh, they 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 will provide it, and then you will be able to join that. Uh, channel or organization uh, or consortium. Okay. Uh, I think uh, there were a few more people asking about failover mechanisms, uh, Shanak. Like for example, what if the network or node goes down? So maybe if you want to address that live. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so a network goes down. So net uh, all the failover uh, again is uh, to be managed by Kubernetes, and that is why we are using Kubernetes, and we are not taking uh, the uh, what should I say the the maintenance of of that. It's all uh, that we should be done by Kubernetes because all the orderers and the pods, uh, sorry, the peers are all. Kubernetes deployment. So if if a node fails on your Amazon EKS, it is again one at one level up. We are using managed Kubernetes. We always encourage people to use managed Kubernetes. Uh, that that is the cloud provider's headache to to actually set up, uh, bring up the if the whole Kubernetes cluster is failed. But again, uh, the advantage that we provide, of course, is that all our code, uh, all the configuration, like the Helm value files, and well, as well as the charts, are stored in your uh, Git repository. And if if both uh, Amazon region is down and uh, the whole GitHub is uh, uh, down, so that is a super rare scenario, which means all our lives are in danger. Uh, so <laughs> so that is that will happen very rarely, right? So you can actually spin up the whole thing again, but of course that data may be missing because if your whole network is down. So that's when you any app, any user who is doing it should do their own uh, backup and uh, restore strategies because that will be again client dependent. Okay, uh, Sonak and Priyanka, I have a question. Kamlesh here. Yeah, so, Kamlesh. Uh, so uh, is there any trick how many uh, uh, production grade deployed using the BF and uh, an another thing. Uh, how do you uh, see the difference between the silo and the web? Okay, so the first question on on production deployment. Yeah, there has been uh, there has been already production deployments uh, in in the range of uh, around four. Uh, for BAF and more uh, are already in progress. In progress. Yeah. So, so uh, those, uh, it's, those are from Accenture only or from the open source community? So they are, I mean, the ones from Accenture only we know about. If there yes. are things happening in open source, we don't know. I mean, I would request yes. anyone yes. who is there listening, if they're using it, please say <laughs> that, yes, know. we are using it. Yeah. So we don't Tumblish, know. If, um, so it's very important to be know the community because is there any open source project, how many are in, in production and how people are using it. So Kamlesh, I would like to add something here, okay? So open yeah. source is, is also sometimes a black box. Uh, the reason being, say if our documentation is pretty much clear and somebody is using it and they haven't contacted us on Rocket Chat, we would definitely not know. And actually, this has happened with us. So one of our clients, uh, without naming them, uh, who were involved no with us, not for blockchain, but some, some other um, um, uh, implementation, they contacted the account team saying that, hey, we are using BAF, which is built by you. And then they inquired and reached back to us. So, you know, they just went ahead and we got information quite late. So, um, I, we, hence the request from the community is that if, you know, please go ahead, try and use it, um, you know, take the value out of it and, and, and let us know. Um, because we do yeah. have information only on what we have done in, within Accenture. Yeah. 
And that is where we encourage people to join our open planning and as well as open PI demos where you can say, yeah, I am, I'm using it in, in XYZ client or even without naming the client, I'm using it for yeah. our project. Uh, and we are trying to do this and DAP doesn't uh, do this uh, or yeah, it is, okay. I have a problem. So those kind of info, that is why we encourage people to join our community calls as well. Yeah. So one uh, question is, um, we can handle multiple applications using BAF. Uh, I think you're uh, meaning front-end applications, right? So Shonak, it's plugged yeah, in. Yeah, I mean, that is, yeah, yeah exactly. So that, that is how you design your uh, your application, right? Because uh, when when you are using BAF, as, as I said, we, we have already open sourced uh, the supply chain application, REF application, as well as we have for the Indy, we have the implementation of the Alice, Bo Alice and Faber University, that example, uh, which is the AD, which uses the ADS components. So you have a reference application on how we would like you to design your applications, but you can always go ahead and do it some, in, like, in some, how, some other format. Uh, but uh, our application or BAF asks, uh, the sample that provides is, is, is the supply chain application, which is microservice design, and it has separate API uh, components and separate uh, REST server or components. And uh, all of them are uh, with, kept in my, designed with the microservices principle. Uh, so we, you, if you want to design an application which uses, uh, because the application is not going to use BAF as such, the application is going to use the fabric or the BASU network that you have created, which is supported, which, which is on, on the fabric uh, support, right? How you design your application. So Shanak, we are almost uh, time. One last question from Kartike, uh, which you can see right in the Q&A, if you would yeah. like to take that, yes. So Kubernetes cluster consists of peer, orderer, couch, DB, or and peers are separate. Right. So this is, again, how you design it. So, I mean, of course, as I, I've shown you, the I think there was a question on Rocket Chat as well, that can you do an orderer and peer organization? So right now, out of the box, BAF doesn't support an orderer and peer in the same organization. So uh, uh, organization can either be orderer and either be peer. Uh, so... If, if it's an order organization, all the order components will be in the same cluster. And if it is a peer organization, all the peer components will be in, in a different, in, a, in the same cluster. And they, they can be different uh, from each other. And as I mean, if people know about Kubernetes concepts, we anyway create a namespace uh, for each of the organizations. So they are logically, even if you deploy all of them in the same cluster, they are logically in, in different uh, namespaces. Uh, so yeah, so that's how it is. I mean, is that what you wanted to ask? Otherwise, you can ask the question if it is not. So, Shanak, I think we'll have to now give it back to. Yeah, the, sure. Yeah. So, I'll, I'll just, uh, you know, once again, this is uh, the screen. Um, I mean, sorry, I think I'm. It's not... Oh, sorry. Yes. So, you know, please come and collaborate. Uh, mm, we, we have a wiki page where you will find all the details, uh, even the good first issues that you can pick to contribute. Uh, you can view our roadmap and please contact us on our rocket chat. So this will be shared to all the participants, right, Arun? Welcome, Leish. Yes, it's Priyanka. We'll share okay. out these PPT or any material which you're going to share us on our Wikipedia page. And we'll also send out a video communication link, the recorded version of this session. and. And thank you, Priyanka and, and Shanak. This was a great session today. And for all the attendees, we will have a continued version of blockchain automation framework on 21st November. And then Priyanka, thanks for that. And uh, Priyanka has accepted our invite to join again on 21st. And then we will have a detailed version or maybe detailed demo of Fabric shown on 21st November. Again, once again, thank you, Shanak and, and Priyanka. Thank you. So, Continuing our session for today, uh, up next, we have a great session from Attila, who is a PhD student at Budapest University. And then he's going to present to us about Hyperledger Caliper. So Hyperledger Caliper is a, is a tool which we can use to benchmark our blockchain deployments. So over to you, Attila. Uh, thank you, Arun. I will share my screen now. 
and hopefully you can see the full screen slides. Yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, this presentation will be about a high level introduction to the current version of Hyperagile Caliper. Since uh, we experienced in the forums and channels that there is there are still some general misunderstanding about uh, Caliper. So my name is Attila Klanik and I will uh, do this presentation. I'm a research assistant in the Budapest University of Technology and also a maintainer of Caliper. And along with co-maintainers, uh, Nick Lincoln and David Carsey from IBM UK. So just to put Caliper uh, into scope, Caliper is a virtual generation generator tool uh, which can target uh, complex distributed systems and it's a performance measurement benchmarking tool. Uh, this is an important distinction. So Caliper cannot deploy uh, DLTs, that's left for the previous presentation, and uh, data analysts are not out of the job yet, so we, Caliper cannot perform the effective uh, performance analysis or evaluation, it just gives you the results of the <clears throat> workload generation. So that's, I think it's important to uh, distinguish between these uh, uh, concerns, uh, what Caliper can do and can't do and won't do ever. So uh, this presentation is built around the uh, three main traits of Caliper, which is its flexibility, scalability, and extensibility. And uh, in the upcoming minutes, I will talk about these a uh, little bit more. So uh, from a really, really uh, bird's eye view, we have Hypecaja Caliper as a tool uh, and the system under test, which is currently can be four types of uh, blockchain platforms. Hyperledger Bezu, Ethereum uh, Networks, Hyperledger Fabric, and uh, Fisco BCOS. And uh, you will see a lot of boxes during this presentation. I don't want to uh, go into too much detail, so you won't see too many texts. I just want you to focus on the architecture and components of Caliper and their responsibility. So from starting really far, uh, Caliper generates workloads towards uh, system under tests and measures the responses. That's the main purpose of Caliper. And uh, from now on, we'll just focus on Caliper and leave out the uh, SUTs uh, of this equation. So let's start with the flexibility of Caliper. Uh, at what we mean by it. So uh, as a tool, you give Caliper some configurations and measurement artifacts, and it will generate a performance report uh, regarding uh, the given SUT. And uh, what we mean by flexibility is that you have numerous options to configure how Caliper interacts with the backend system, how the uh, benchmark is performed, how it's structured, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you have three main configuration options for Caliper. One is a benchmark configuration, a network configuration, and the runtime configuration. As you would guess, the network configuration uh, describes the system under test. So where can you find uh, its endpoints? Uh, who are the participants? What kind of identities are present in the system, like user or clients? And uh, Caliper uses this information to basically connect to a network with arbitrary topology. The other uh, important piece is the benchmark configuration file, which will uh, describe the structure of your uh, um, performance benchmarking. Uh, namely, you can separate your benchmark into different rounds, for example, targeting different smart contracts or targeting the same smart contracts with different kinds of parameters or with different kind of uh, at a different kind of rate. Uh, for the runtime configuration, I will uh, ignore those. Uh, you can find a detailed description about them in the documentation, but those can basically affect the runtime behavior of Caliper, for example, performing some task or skipping some task or any other uh, intricacies you might want to perform. <clears throat> Uh, since <clears throat> enterprise uh, DLTs have a strong selling point uh, when it comes to performance, uh, the workload generator side also has too much this kind of scalability and performability. So 
Caliper tackles scalability issues by using worker services to actually perform this round. So now we split the big uh, blue box into two mm, main component types, a Caliper manager service and multiple Caliper uh, worker services. The manager service uh, orchestrates the workers and uh, mm, keeps a means of communication among these services. We will see the options for this soon. And the workers are the exact services that actually communicate with the system under tests and uh, send the uh, specified requests. Uh, now, the orchestration and communication texts are just uh, general descriptions of what is happening between those services, but there are several options to actually uh, implement or configure this. Option number one is when the manager service automatically spawns child caliper worker services and communicates them through interprocess communication. This is a, a kind of a sandbox mode. Uh, it's easy to use. You don't have to concern yourself with caliper workers. Uh, it just works out of the box. You call the manager service and everything else is handled to you. You see a dash line around the manager and worker uh, services. That means the host uh, machine boundary. So when you spawn processes and using IPC, of course, every service will run in the same uh, host, which can impact scalability a lot. Uh, a middle step towards the real scenario is when you switch interprocess communication to some uh, third party communication method. Currently, Caliper supports an MQTT uh, protocol, so you can use uh, MQTT broker as a means of communication between the manager and the worker processes. But in this scenario, the Caliper manager still handles the workers automatically, so we are still in the same uh, host boundary as before. And now the uh, last deployment scenario, the real deal, the scalability uh, version of Caliper, where the Caliper manager don't manage the workers anymore. You uh, start every service separately and manually and provide them a common MQTT broker through which they can communicate. In this case, you can uh, deploy your services uh, however you want. Uh, you can scale out horizontally as far as your credit card can reach. So uh, really, there is no uh, limitation here. When I say you have to manage the workers manually, that's a bit of a stretch uh, because a lot of container management platforms like Docker Swarm or Kubernetes uh, allows you to simply uh, request a number of replicas from a service. You can say, I want 100 caliper workers and it will be created for you. So uh, there is no manual labor involved, uh, only just setting up the communication between the services. So this is the backbone uh, for Caliper scalability, the fully distributed scenario uh, communicating uh, services through MQTT broker. The other selling point for Caliper is its extensibility. And let's see what we mean by this. So as we discussed, uh, workers are the actual uh, heavy lifters of calipers. They perform the actual uh, workload generation towards the system under test, and uh, <clears throat> they are instructed by the manager to perform some tasks. So let's dig into workers a little bit, because that's where the magic or uh, so-called magic happens. Let's suppose that the manager service says to a worker that, please execute now the first round with the given parameters and how it's actually done. The worker logic is really simple. It's a main workload generation loop. Uh, you have a rate controller component and the workload module component. A rate controller component is kind of a, a, a delay switch uh, or simply by breaking a circuit break if you are coming from digital uh, circuit design. So when it's time for the next transaction or the next, next request. The rate controller simply gives up its control. And now it's time for the workload module to actually assemble the transaction. And it repeats and repeats and repeats until some criteria is met. For example, you submitted 100 transactions or some time-based uh, criteria. So this is the backbone and the hot pass for the workload, uh, for the caliper workers, a rate control mechanism that uh, schedules 
the transactions and the workload module, which is actually supplied by the user, so by you. Uh, and this can be an any arbitrary module and whatever you can code in JavaScript. So there are no restrictions. Your only job is to uh, when the time comes, so when you receive control in your module, uh, fill out the parameters of a transaction and uh, send it to the uh, system under test. Okay, but how do you send it to system under test? Do you have to anticipate for every kind of different platforms or how is it uh, handled by Caliper? Uh, luckily, most of the details are hidden from your uh, workload module with a simple non-magical uh, design pattern, the connector pattern. So workload module see an abstract uh, interface of a system under test through which they can easily uh, submit a request or batch of requests. And every other detail, every communication and handle uh, is handled by you, uh, by, uh, is hidden from you uh, by Caliper and the uh, contributors implemented these uh, suit connectors. So when I say that Caliper can support Hyperledger, Bezu, Ethereum, Fabric, and Fisco, I mean that there are four different connectors implemented uh, in the Caliper code base that can handle communication with these services. And as you will see, uh, you can easily add your own if you want. So there is no magic involved, just a simple abstraction for your workload module. I mentioned a lot of components here, and all of those have some predefined implementations, some configura configurability points, but uh, the first selling point of Caliper is extensibility, and that wouldn't be whole without uh, allowing you to bring your own component to the uh, dance. I tried to summarize the main extension points for Caliper. Uh, there are the resource monitors, which I uh, didn't cover uh, now because um, it's not the main backbone of Caliper, but basically those are the monitors that can uh, uh, look out for any uh, anomalies or uh, track the different data provided by specific sources. For example, we can track the uh, utilization, CPU utilization, or other metrics of local processes or local or remote Docker containers or we can just pull such data from a general Prometheus server and include the results in our uh, report, report. Or you can bring your own monitor because it's a pluggable component. You can, for example, pull this data from your InfluxDB server or whatever you want. The other uh, extension points are transaction monitors, which uh, reside inside the worker processes and they receive every kind of uh, event about transactions. So a transaction was submitted, a transaction was finished with these results, and you do whatever you want with this uh, data. For example, we have an internal transaction monitor that actually will compute the performance characteristics of the benchmark. We have a Prometheus uh, transaction monitor that will publish uh, Prometheus time series data about the uh, submitted, executed, uh, failed transactions and their timings. We have a simple monitor that just drops the uh, results as a log to the standard out to be collected by other pipelines. And you can create a simple transaction monitor to connect with your favorite database backend or CSV exporter or whatever you want. There are many rate controllers uh, provided by Caliper. I just listed the main ones, uh, fixed rate controller, linearly increasing rate, and uh, controller that tries to maintain the maximum rate without overloading the SUT. So as you can see, the complexity of these controllers can vary. And of course, this is a pluggable component also, so bring your own implementation. And the heaviest components in Caliper are the SUT connectors. Uh, we have four of them currently, and we have a detailed uh, documentation page about how to write your own connector to your own uh, blockchain platform or any kind of platform really. So don't hesitate to contribute your own uh, platform to the Caliper ecosystem. I try to give you some high level overview about the Caliper components without going into too much detail to distract you. And uh, but you can find everything detailed documented in the Caliper documentation site if you scan this QR code, or you can navigate there from the uh, GitHub page. And uh, now I think uh, 
I saw some Q&A notification pop up. So <clears throat> I think I will start answering them. OK, so question, how, how to get estimate on how many transactions of Fabric supports? Mm, as I mentioned, there is a maximum rate controller which uh, tries to gradually increase the transaction rate uh, of Caliper until your uh, SUT can handle it. So using this rate controller, you can see that uh, slowly the rate climbs up and it will stop at some point because it will detect that fabric, for example, is overloaded. That way you can kind of estimate the maximum rate fabric can handle. But of course, this can depend on a lot of uh, configuration options, even in the fabric side. So uh, currently we can't really do these configurations automatical, automatically for you. So for example, we can find the best configuration to uh, reach the maximum throughput. That's still a task for uh, designers and uh, data analysts. But with this, you can kind of figure out where the limits of the system are. Or if you use a linear rate controller, you start increasing the rate uh, continuously and at one point you will see your system break down or get overloaded and then you found your uh, limit. I hope this uh, answered the question. So you need to come up with your own strategies but we provide some basic components on which you can build. Um, Support for multi-chain architecture? Mm, no. Uh, currently, Caliper can only interact with a single SUT type uh, during a single benchmark. Um, it depends on your scenario whether you can uh, whether you can I don't know somehow circumvent this. Possible. You don't need to have. Uh, in the access in Caliper anyhow, or you can put your in the access in the uh, workload implementation, which is kind of a hacky workaround, but it would work. But Caliper currently supports a single SUT per run. Are there any more questions? Or a lot of these are Oh, these are the previous questions, sorry. <laughs> Any more Caliper related questions? If not, then uh, head to the documentation site if you're interested in the details or contact us in Rocket Chat and uh, contributors or Caliper's channel. And especially if you want to add your new platform to the Caliper repertoire, then definitely contact us and Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Attila. Um, so there is one more question, which is if there is a demo possible. Mm, yeah, I deliberately didn't prepare a demo for today. So live demos are kind of a, a ghost uh, for presentations. Mm, there is a detailed tutorial for Caliper available from the documentation page. So uh, you can head there, but uh, in the upcoming uh, next release or after that, we plan to do a detailed introduction uh, presentation to Caliper since we'll have some major updates then. So that will also include the demo. I didn't want to derail the high level introduction with low level uh, codes, so uh, I didn't prepare that for today. But the documentation contains it. Awesome. And thanks, Attila. This was a great session. And attendees please feel free to ask all your questions and Attila will be available with us to answer more questions and you may also feel free to reach out to Hyperledger Caliper Racketer channel as well so all your questions will be answered there and then you could also join the contributors meeting which happens and you will find the details in Hyperledger's public calendar of invite and thanks Attila this was a great session and up next we have a talk on uh, Hyperledger Explorer and to give a talk on Hyperledger Explorer we have two of the maintainers with us Atsushi and, and Jiva I'll hand it over to them over to you Atsushi
Ya. Hey, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, based on your location. So I hope everyone is safe and doing good. I'm Jiva from DTCC Chennai, and with me is Atushi from Australia. Together, we are going to introduce Hyperledger Explorer through a presentation. We have been contributing to this project for the last two years. We will have an interactive session at the end of the presentation when you can post your question and we will try our best to answer your questions. So we are going to go through the following topics for this session. The overview of Hyperledger Explorer, terminology, what are the common terminology we have used in that Hyperledger Explorer, the next features, architecture overview, then deployment pattern. Finally, we'll see the demo. So hope everyone know Hyperledger is a tool for visualizing the blockchain operation of the Hyperledger fabric platform. So it's the first ever blockchain explorer for the you know, permission ledger. So it allows anyone to explore the distributor ledger being uh, created by Hyperledger members from the inside. So, but it does not compromise their privacy. So, you know, uh, it's like a permission, but within the Hyperledger member can, you know, access that ledger projects. So let us now talk about the overview of Hyperledger Explorer. The Hyperledger Explorer was initially proposed to buy, proposed to buy DTCC, Intel and IBM as a future to visualize the data which is getting stored on the ledger. So the proposal was approved by the TSCC Technical Steering Committee in August 2016. After that, the development of the tool was started in September 2016 with the many minor releases. The first major releases, right? So version 1.0.0 was made in April 2020. In July 2020, we released version 1.1.0 with many improvements and migrated from the JavaScript to TypeScript. Currently, Hyperledger Explorer supports Fabric, and we are working on supporting like a Eroha and other DLT platform also. Uh, hope it will, next releases, it will release that one. Hyperledger Explorer was developed using the latest technologies such as ReactJS with the Google Material UI, Node.js, WebSocket, Postgres SQL, and Azure Pipeline. So hope everyone know, but I would like to say like, you know, ReactJS is the front-end framework for the client and Node.js is the back-end framework for implementing the server-side component. WebSocket is used to push the information from the server to the client. Postgres used for store the information of blocks, transactions, and channels. So Azure DevOps has been used to automate the bills and run the test for checking our code coverage. So after we raise the PR, right? So it automatically job will trigger the defined by the Azure pipeline. So these are the technology we have used in Hyperledger Explorer. Now let's look into the keywords uh, which are commonly used in the Hyperledger Explorer. Hope everyone know, but I would like to say before uh, architecture view features, so I would like to say, we'll see the terminology based on that, you know, we'll get the easily the data. So channel, so what is channel? Channel, it's like, you know, uh, private of subnet of communications between a two or more network members that is called channel. So peer, each node is a peer, like you know, a computer connected to the network that is called a peer. Then we are using the term as a transaction. So it's transaction, it's like, you know, it's an invoke, invoke a result or instantiated the result that is submitted or ordering or validation and committing for that, it's a transaction. So what the transaction is, we have created, right? So it's set of transaction is cryptographically linked to the, you know, preceding the sub block. So that is, they are calling us a blocks. Chain code. 
chain code is like you know so whatever we are writing our business logic right we are using this called as a chain code our business logic will be there in the chain code uh, the chain code will be written in of the supported language either go or java it is like you know installed or instantiated through the sdk or cli onto a network of hyperledger fabric peer nodes it's enabling the interaction with the network shared ledger so these are the terminology we have used in hyperledger explorer so let's look at the features what are the features we have integrated in our hyperledger explorer so this tool provides a you know provides an user friendly web application for hyperledger to view the query blocks transaction and associated data also we are displaying the network information of name status list of nodes then chain code of transaction families like you know we can view the transaction we can invoke the transaction we can deploy or we can query the transaction so that features and all we have integrated in our hyperledger explorer also any other relevant information also stored in our ledger so it can be we have other future it can be used to search the filter and transaction by date and range of channel dynamically discover the new channels and switch data presentations of channels also we can get real time notification of new plugs if anything is fabric uh, we uh, new transactions happen it's automatically triggered to the hyperledger explorer we can get the real time notification also latestly we have integrated the user management function so it, this this module right so allows you to create a user manage the users of roles defined in the default security realm we must be logged in as a member of the administrator to add and delete the user if you want to add the user or if you want to delete the user you should be like you know must be logged in as a administrator so now atushi will take over please atushi we can see your screen atushi uh, i think you are on mute yeah we can't hear you atushi uh, maybe your mic is on mute um maybe do you need to no maybe do you need to change the source of your mic And, and all the attendees, we did test the feature just before the call. Maybe Atushi is facing some issues. We'll give a couple of minutes. um no um probably will uh can you hear me yes now it is better ah yeah. okay sorry uh okay uh sorry for inconvenience uh the next slide 
uh, in the next several slides, I will give you an introduction about the uh, architecture of uh, Explorer. And, uh, and also, I will give you some uh, deployment pattern of the Explorer and give you a demonstration showing the, how to deploy the fabric test network and the fabric uh, HyperHJ Explorer. In the, in the end, I will also share the, our uh, next uh, development plan. Okay. Uh, in this slide, uh, I'm going to explain about the, an overview of the architecture. Uh, as you can see, uh, Explorer has a typical three-tier architecture, consists of a front end and uh, sorry, and server backend and uh, data backend. And uh, in the front end layer, uh, there is a React Redux uh, single page application, and this React.js application get access to this web API server to get data from uh, underlying fabric network. And uh, in this uh, server backend layer, uh, there are two processes running in parallel. And uh, one is for providing a data access API. And the left hand side, uh, the other one, for collecting block data from blockchain network uh, and storing these data into database. Uh, we call uh, this process as a synchronizer process. And as you can see in this diagram, we have API server uh, uh, basically does not access to the fabric network. It always looking at the database and the database is basically updated by uh, only by synchronizer process. And the synchronizer process uh, interacts with the fabric network uh, via a fabric SDK for Node.js. And for this uh, interaction, uh, the administrator of the Explorer application needs to specify uh, the information. One is the connection profiler. Uh, profile of fabric network and the other one is a crypto artifact uh, which are generated when you started the fabric network and these two materials are used for accessing fabric networks through the SDK and the synchronizer is periodically watching fabric network uh, to see if there is any change on the network through the service discovery function. And uh, once synchronizer gets new information, such as a uh, new block data, or new pure nodes, and so on, the information is stored into Postgres database. And Web API server uh, basically use these records to showing uh, for showing each graph on the dashboard. And the synchronizer process uh, does not only query to fabric network, sorry, but also receive block event from fabric network when a new block data is generated on the network. And this event is passed to the web API server through the inter-process communication using message and uh, ultimately uh, displayed on the dashboard of your web socket. Now, uh, the key takeaway from this slide is uh, the architecture is quite simple. 
So of course, uh, we know uh, there are some complexity in our code base, and we still have some uh, code cleanup to be done. But I think most of the technology stack we are using in this project are quite popular and easy to use. So I am I believe uh, that most of people can easily start small contribution in this project. Uh, Atushi, one question. Uh, is it possible to add only the front end without replicating the data in the Postgres DB or query from our own DB? Sorry? Uh, so they have raised the QA. Uh, is it possible mm -hmm. to add only the front end without replicating the data in the Postgres DB or query from our own DB? Uh, uh, I think. Uh... Okay, uh, sorry. Uh, I think possible to replicate the front end without uh, modifying the any back end. So, yeah. Uh, I yeah, it's possible. Okay. I think the question is to check. If we can use any other database, if not Postgres, can we use any other database with Explorer? Uh, at, at this moment, I, uh, you cannot use any other database, but uh, yeah, that's the answer so far. But we are using some abstraction layer uh, for accessing the database. So with some uh, code changes, uh, it should be possible, I believe. Hopefully, that's okay. Yep, that answers. Thanks. Thanks. And, uh, and in the next few slide, I will take an introduction of the uh, deployment pattern for Explorer. And the first one is a basic deployment uh, for those who are using Explorer first time. Uh, in this deployment pattern, uh, all related uh, components are located on a single machine as a container and a native application. But Fabric Network is running on the virtual network on the Docker machine and the Explorer is running outside of the Docker container as a native application. So a Explorer needs some host name translation to communicate with Fabric Nodo endpoint. Uh, this host name translation is uh, automatically done by Fabric SDK. If enable the option, of this translation in the setting of the Explorer. Uh, in this case, uh, all endpoints on the Docker container are exposing a port number to the, to the outside of Docker machine like this. So when you configure your connection profile for Explorer, you need to specify an endpoint with a local host and same port number like this. And one more thing, uh, in this case, in this uh, deployment pattern, you need to install some software such as, uh, of course, Node.js and also Postgres database in uh, your host site. In the contrast, uh, in the deployment pattern two, you don't need to install any software because uh, all components are running as a Docker container. Of course, uh, you need to Docker machine to do this deployment, but I believe the Docker has already been installed uh, 
on the machine because our public network is already running as a container. And in this pattern, all components are located within the same virtual network on the Docker machine. So they can, and they can talk each other directly without any host or name translation. And what you need to do is two things. One, uh, in connection profile, specify each uh, endpoint is a host name, which is buried within the Docker machine. And also specify path to crypt artifact with a buried path within the Docker machine. And this pattern needs less effort to bring up Explorer on your environment, uh, but sometimes it requires requires user to understand about the Docker. The last one is uh, each component has been deployed uh, in separated machine or VM or pods if you are targeting a Kubernetes cluster. And you can separate uh, web API and synchronize our process uh, into different machine like this. And uh, they were still using same uh, explorer container image, but by overriding some run command for the image and configure, changing configure, now you can bring up a synchronizer process without web API server or uh, bring up only Web API server without the synchronizer process. And if you want to make a reliability of a Web API server much higher or workload on a Web API server uh, distributed, then you can also deploy a uh, multiple instance in your environment. Deploy multiple instance for Web API server in your environment. And that's all, that's all my uh, all major three type of deployment pattern for Explorer. Uh, now uh, I'm going to share, uh, show you the demonstration to bring up Hyperledger Fabric test network and Hyperledger Explorer application. Uh, this is same with deployment pattern one. That is uh, all component are located within a single machine and uh, Explorer get run as a native application. Let's get started. And uh, okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, the demo start with the cloning uh, of fabric sample depository, and uh, once clone gets done, uh, you need to switch the code base into one version two dot one dot one, and you also need to get hyperledger fabric binaries. Uh, required to generate crypt artifact and control a chain code. And uh, you also need to get, uh, uh, after finishing to download the binary, uh, you need to add the binary uh, to, to your pass environment and make sure that you can call the two correctly and see the expected margin. Now it's get all done to start uh, 
to start a net test network by using script and test network, as you know, uh, consists of uh, two organizations and one orderer, which is in common between the, these organizations. And once script finished, you see the three containers running. And uh, one is the order uh, node there, and the other two is uh, PR node for each organization. And uh, as you can see, uh, the peer is belonging a channel, in this case, my channel. And after joining the channel, uh, deploy a chain code to the network, like this. And after completing the deployment, next need to define some environment variable for executing chain code invocation. Yep, like this. And now you can invoke the chain codes successfully here. Now that's all for the setup of a fabric test network. And uh, yep, and in the next uh, few steps, I will show how, how to bring up Hyperledger Explorer for the test network. First, clone the repository. And uh, next, need install the node package dependency for each component. That is a web API server backend and React.js frontend. And uh, yeah, now installing the dependency for the client side, that means front end. And also only for the front end, need for one more step for building the source code of J React to JS application. Done. Okay. In the, in the next few, uh, in the next steps, uh, we need to modify the sample profile or connection profile for running a test network. The sample profile located is here, and uh, we can find it here. In this file, uh, we can find some uh, path to certificate or private key in here. And we need to get this path modified to actual host side path. And this sample uh, file is uh, by default prepared for this uh, test network. So uh, basically, uh, you only need to change a few parts. And after finishing to modify the connection profile and uh, needs to set up database for Explorer on PostgreSQL SQL database. And this is the uh, uh, last step uh, required to run Explorer. And by using uh, script we provide, uh, you can easily to do this setup. And once complete the uh, script, a uh, database called the Fabric Explorer is created in the PostgreSQL database like this. Uh, now uh, that's all done.
then uh, you can use uh, start. You can start Explorer with uh, NDP um, script and navigate to localhost with port number 8080. And uh, login. You can log in to the dashboard with the uh, administrator credential defined in the UF connection profile. And then we could start Explorer with the test network successfully. And also you can view the each block data and transaction in the separate view. Like this. <coughs> And when generating a transaction continuously by using some command line to generating a continuous traffic in the prod network. Now uh, you can see the notification in the dashboard and also you can see the real time dashboard updated. Yep. Uh, okay, that's all the, for the demonstration. And uh, at the final part of uh, this introduction from my side, uh, I will share our next development plan. Uh, while we keep up with the latest fabric uh, platform and uh, resolving detected issues, we also trying to introduce new features at the same time. Uh, currently, we are planning implementation of the following two major interesting feature by working together with the new contributors. First one is uh, newly adding more information and metrics on Explorer. Uh, in the current plan, we are going to show the endorsement policy of each chain code to make user uh, easily easier to understand their, their network. And it will suppose uh, endorsement policy for the chain code definition level and the private data collection level. And also we'd like to add metrics of each node on Fabric Network to the dashboard. And we are going to use the metrics exposed from each peer via Prometheus protocol. And the other one, the other major feature is uh, raising up the Explorer as the next level Redger data query platform. Uh, in the current Explorer, uh, as you can see a uh, little bit in the demo section, uh, it provides, provides the raw data rather than human readable data for each block and transaction. So this plan includes uh, tracking feature for historical operation of any specific asset or state, and also automatic schema analyzing feature of payload in each transaction. Uh, by introducing this kind of feature, we are expecting that uh, this feature will provide you uh, deeper data insight and uh, more flexible query. And uh, yeah, we believe uh, it's, it will be fantastic contribution to the community. And uh, uh, we are looking forward to pushing this plan to the release in months later. And that's all my part. And uh, in the end, I'm, uh, we'd like to appreciate so much to the great contributors and this fantastic proposal. And of course, uh, I'd like to say thank you 
all for joining this session. Uh, if you are interested with this plan, please always we are welcoming your contribution and please reach out us or explore our community. Okay, I will hand back to Jiva. Yeah. Thank you, Atushi, for that fantastic demo. I'm sure now everyone now has a better understanding of Hyperledger Explorer. And many of you may be thinking, how could you help you to contribute, right? If it would be a great if all you were able to contribute towards the Hyperledger Explorer project, okay? So you can contribute by reporting issues, features request, documentation update, and code development. So this is how you can get involved. So you can subscribe and join our mailing list. If you are the first time user, then you will be asked to create a Linux Foundation ID and join the Explorer chat with us to start the conversation, whatever, if you are facing any issue or if you're willing to contribute this Explorer, so you can contact us in the Rocket channel. We also have a bi-weekly contributors meeting occurring every Thursday at 4 p.m. IST time zone. So you, we always welcome you, welcome you to contribute this project. So these are the links for your reference, uh, a link for link to the documentation site. So you can refer this link, then a link to the code repository. You can, we have given, you know, brief the readme. So based on that you will to set up your locally. So based on the link, you can follow that. And links to the Docker hub, where you can find the image for the deployment. So use this link for the reference. So, thank you so much. Now let's have an any, if you have any questions, so we can clarify that. So thank you so much for all. Thank you very much, Jiva and, and to see. It was a great presentation on Hyperledger's um, Explorer. So, um, up next, we have a talk coming up from Idowu on hype on blockchain, right? Whether our use case is suitable for suitable to use blockchain or should we not go for it? And then how do we decide the life cycle? And over to you, Idowu, on the next topic. And Idowu is joining us from uh, Nigeria in, in Africa. Yes, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've, I've heard a lot of technical um, conversations here today, you know, from the blockchain automation framework, uh, which I think is absolutely genius. Uh, uh, in the in the sense that it um, that it eliminates many of the frustrations and headaches of people trying to um, deploy production networks, okay, uh, all the way to Caliper, you know, a tool for measuring workloads, measuring uh, essentially an instrumentation and uh, uh, efficiency or a metrics uh, measurement tool for your for your network. Uh, and then lastly, the Explorer, which finally gives us a visual interface to uh, interact with and consume the information that is being emitted out of the network second by second as it keeps on uh, operating, as it keeps on running. Um, I've often said that um, the future of blockchain adoption is business blockchain, and you see me, and, and you see that in a few slides uh, 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 to come. And then further, the future of blockchain adoption has to, will depend largely on the development of abstractions, abstraction frameworks, you know. Um, so these three things that I will mention today are tools, you know, just using that word loosely, that help us, well, human beings to better interact with the uh, highly technical uh, information and base foundational uh, uh, you know, software or applications that are called blockchain frameworks. So essentially, 
the value of these sessions today and mine that, I'll, that I'm about to start is to help us see how there is value in creating a bridge between that technical base of knowledge that is a blockchain and interfaces, uh, tools, abstractions that enable human beings to interact with all of that technology. Uh, the best analogy sometimes may be to use something like a car, right? Because uh, 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 I think that the word dashboard, the most popular use of the word dashboard is with cars, okay? So uh, probably the most familiar example that everybody will be able to connect with is to think about a car. When you think about it, your dashboard at, in, in your car essentially abstracts away all of the complexity of the engine that is driving that vehicle, that, that is enabling that vehicle to work. So uh, uh, that's essentially what uh, are the points I'm trying to make. So uh, without much, for, much further ado, uh, our agenda will cover a bit of rudimentary discussions about the foundations of what are blockchains just to set up the stage, just to set up the context. So we'll talk about uh, uh, what blockchain is. We'll spend a bit of time talking about why blockchain because I get the question every day by in, in, in person, in chat, on LinkedIn, in so many communities, this thing called blockchain. In fact, I remember someone asking me a few days ago relating to the, to the current ongoing US elections that if blockchains and elections are so revolutionary, why are they not using it in the US? And I had to explain that, you know, some of those decisions are not technical decisions, they are political and business decisions. So, um, so, so we'll talk about those, those, those human aspects of uh, business blockchain or rather blockchain adoption, okay? So there's why blockchain and then there's why block business blockchain. Uh, now, Hyperledger as a business, as a family of business blockchain tools and frameworks, what's their vision, what are their goals, and what is the market traction? What is the traction? What's the industry saying? How is the industry reacting to Hyperledger? If it is a hype, if it's just hype, why is the industry appearing to pick up Hyperledger's um, um, tools and frameworks at such a high rate, you know, and you see all those things. So we'll, we'll, we'll take a focused look at uh, Hyperledger frameworks as well as the use cases, and then we'll give a call to action. If you want to get involved, there's a number of things to do. So, um, of course, these are foundational things. Uh, um, blockchains typically include the, 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 the ledgers as well as the smart contracts that run on those ledgers. We'll come, we'll come to definitions of those things. What's a blockchain? At the end of the day, a blockchain is a database, right? Because when you think about it, a blockchain is an iteration, is an improvement, is an optimization of the traditional ledger. Our, our traditional relational databases essentially are ledgers that help us to track information in either transactional format, if you're thinking about EF codes, or relational database format, or, 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 or any other format. At the end of the day, a database is a record keeping system, right? Uh, blockchains are also record keeping systems, but they have certain characteristics, certain attributes, certain properties about them that help them be more useful in certain scenarios. So let me quickly run to why, why, why blockchains, why distributed ledgers. And you will see three major, three major considerations, okay? Uh, can you see my screen? By now I should be presenting actually, apologies for that. Okay. All right, thank you. All right. Um, um, can you see the presentation? Yes, we, we see it. All right. Um, so what are the considerations for business blockchain, okay? One, blockchains were not designed for individual use. Blockchains were not designed, a blockchain is not a, it's not a sheet of paper, right? Um, blockchains were designed for community use. So you need, a, in theory, in principle, you need at least two participants, if possible, you know, you know more. So uh, blockchains were designed by definition for communities and ecosystems, okay? Be going further, 
is there a community of people where they periodically and habitually debate the authenticity of the records of the records of information? Is there a community or an ecosystem where the players in that particular um, space constantly have reasons to doubt and or distrust the claims made by other, other players? Those are prime candidates for blockchain, okay? So DLTs are particularly useful in situations where members of a community are mutually, are naturally mutually distrustful of one another. Take the use case, the classic use case of banks, okay? Banks all over the world, not just in Nigeria, not just in Africa, all over the world, usually compete with one another head-to-head, -head, red ocean style, you know, you know, you know, deploying a lot of guerrilla, guerrilla tactics against one another. If you, if you, if you envision some kind of product or service or innovation where you will require those naturally mutually distrusting competitors to work together and or collaborate in order to get value from this new product or innovation that you're bringing on board, then a blockchain is a likely candidate, is, is a likely candidate for, for that kind of innovation. Again, one critical aspect of blockchains is what you call the immutable part of it, the immutability of, the, of its ledger. What that means is, the third consideration is, whenever you want to, whenever you are considering a blockchain, it's also important to consider the question, what is the impact of a possible loss of history? What's the impact of a possible loss of, or loss or erasure or tamper of historical data in this particular um, scenario. So take for instance, um, people's bank records, people's financial transaction records, people's employment records, people's immigration records, people's um, medical histories, okay? Across different medical service providers, you know, pharmacies, hospitals, and the like. What is the potential impact that if patient A were to step into hospital A1 today, it would, there is a significant probability that patient A cannot, cannot access his medical histories from hospital B, C, and D. That already sounds like a chaotic situation, right? Because what if there is a medication or a diagnosis that the medical that the doctor needs to provide that depends on understanding the history. Therefore, systems where it is vitally important that the historical log of transactions remains sacrosanct for, the, for eternity, for, the, for as long as possible, right? If it's absolutely important for that kind of integrity of the historical log, then you want to consider blockchains, okay? Again, they were designed to provide a near zero probability of tampering. And that near zero assurance of integrity of the log is provided by, you know, uh, 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 the mathematical, the branch of mathematics called cryptography, you know, and, and you know, that's a bit technical. And like I promised, go technical. I'll, I'll be the bridge between the techies and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the users. All right. So, um, so those are the three typical considerations for considering blockchains. Okay? Um, going further, um, again, this point just says it's vitally important to know that your copy of the ledger is identical to others in the network. So uh, an additional consideration is at any point in time, if you take the medical service example that I just mentioned, for instance, if, if, if you are considering going to hospital A or hospital B, you need to have the assurance at the back of your mind before you set out of your house that regardless of how hospital that you step into, your private and valid authentic medical histories will be equally available for access when you authorize that access across, you know, whatever number of medical service providers. If you cannot guarantee that, then that already tells you that there's a broken quote unquote society or ecosystem of healthcare providers. And then you start to think which of them will give me access, which of them cannot guarantee me access. That's already cuts out the 
What if the one that cannot guarantee you access is the one that provides the better service or better uh, service within your budget? You know, so those are some of the considerations. So it's it's vitally important to be sure that everybody on the network maintains the same copy or the same authentic version of the information or transaction, as the case may be. All right. So um, this is an example scenario that is very very popular and. It's just a, an abstraction, or it's just an elaboration of what I just mentioned about the medical service scenario. So everyone in your room takes a book and someone is calling out numbers, okay? Or calling out instructions. And everyone is writing those things down, okay? That's number two. And then um, there's a request that two people should call out the numbers that they have, okay? At the same time. Uh, of course, because there is a, there is a, there's already a competition because they are doing it at the same time. There needs to be a referee or an umpire or a process to determine who to listen to because they are competing for the same time. That process is slightly technical and it's called a consensus algorithm. We won't go into that because it's technical stuff. It's for the geeks, like you know. Uh, but essentially, just uh, uh, on an overview. Level, that is what a consensus algorithm does. It's essentially an umpire or a referee that determines who, who's ver, who's, whose claim, at least in the, in, in the present time, is, 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 is honored, okay? And when all the parties in the, in the mix, in, this, in that particular room, agree on the, the, the version of, of information that is being uh, proposed, then everybody records that new version in their private ledgers, and then going forward into the future, you can be assured that everybody has the same version of the same information. All right. Smart contracts. Again, um, the word smart contracts coming from the private blockchain section of the blockchain space, the blockchain community, and I'll, and I'll talk about the dichotomy or the differences between private blockchains and public blockchains shortly. Uh, coming from the private blockchain space, essentially where the cryptocurrencies have largely played, there's a lot of talk, you know, a lot of people who are looking for alternative investments. I've been hearing people talk a lot about smart contracts and the context with which people mention that sometimes has me slightly perplexed because I wonder, are you sure you really understand what a smart contract is? But, you know, Regardless of whatever it means to different people, it just sounds like another buzzword to sell or justify, you know, cryptocurrencies. A smart contract, a smart contract is nothing other than a set of instructions that are run when a set of conditions that are executed or followed when a set of conditions are fulfilled. That's essentially what a smart contract is. Okay, so. <clears throat> Um, that's essentially what a smart contract is. The definition here says the code, which is source code or computer program or uh, code snippet that is run whenever the setting conditions are fulfilled on a blockchain. Y you see a very interesting example uh, shortly. Now, this example talks about a talks about a farmer based in Sacramento, California, who buys an insurance agreement that protects him or her from uh, uh, from extreme weather conditions. Obviously, the farmer had envisaged that, oh, should there be a situation sometime in the future where the weather conditions are not favorable to me? I'd like to insure myself against those conditions ahead of time. Fair enough. The insurer, right, the insurance company thought, okay, I'll calculate the risk, the probability of extreme weather conditions happening. Mm, I've done my mathematics and it looks like extreme weather conditions happen once in 300 years. Okay, I will therefore insure you because my mathematics tells me that I am likely not to be liable in not more than once in 300 years. Just, just, just theoretical scenarios. And then they went ahead and documented that policy and said, if for any reason, dear farmer, you experience a steady um, record of a hundred degrees temperature for a hundred consecutive days, 
they will reimburse you with a hundred thousand US dollars of of, 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 of insurance, okay? Uh, that's the agreement, okay? Um, the current state of the insurance industry, and uh, I mean, any innovator that is listening, this is an opportunity for you to start a startup. You know, uh, the current state of the insurance industry is that right now, insurance claims are processed manually. Even though there was a prior agreement of the conditions that should trigger the release of the insured sum automatically, after every event, insurers typically habitually continue to review those conditions again, right? And you wonder what's going on? Was there not a prior agreement? Is there no way with all of the technology in the world today to code some kind of algorithm that automatically, you know, carries out the terms of the contract based on the conditions that have been fulfilled, okay? And that's, and that's the value here, that's, that's the gap, okay? So with a smart contract in place, sitting on any type of blockchain fabric, sort to basu, any of the, any of the typical uh, frameworks, okay? Um, one could write a script, theoretically write a script called a smart contract. Again, uh, I, I explained earlier that a smart contract is a, is a set of instructions that are automatically carried out or executed when certain conditions are fulfilled. Now, the farmer has demonstrated that the conditions have been fulfilled. There's no reason why the insurer should doubt the claim of the farmer. And again, we are saying in this case, if there is such doubt and we build a blockchain solution to address this particular use case, then it should be automatic that the farmer, the insurer should be able to automatically disperse, given that the system also has a way of, of course, verifying that the claims are true, are accurate, are 100% uh, are accurate. If that is the case, then automatically um, disperse the funds, okay? A similar example to this is what, is, what, is what recently happened in my home country, Nigeria. We recently experienced a wave of protests, okay? which got a bit violent, especially in Lagos, Nigeria, where I live. Um, a number of private residents experienced damage to their private properties. Some people, shop owners, some people are retail business owners, some people, their private cars, you know, they just park them in their offices, not in necessarily hazardous or dangerous places, but those cars or those assets were vandalized. I know about a few of them that just got to learn after this incident that the insurance policies they had taken out, even though comprehensive, were not covered or, or rather did not cover this particular case because there is some cost there that says it doesn't cover riots and other civil disturbances and stuff like that. Okay, so theoretically, let's say that it was covered. I think that certain insuring, insurance companies will still look for opportunities to dispute the claims on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think that this is a perfect opportunity for a blockchain solution, right? Which would automatically verify that the conditions, the list of checklist conditions have all passed and automatically disperse the funds to the claimants. You know, so um, essentially that's the concept of a smart contract. I hear it. I have the term smart contract being um, explained in all sorts of contexts, and you know, many times I really don't understand what's going on. Uh, this is the authoritative definition and application of a smart contract. All right. Uh, the second myth I'd like to debunk is that blockchain is not cryptocurrency. Okay. Um, blockchain, rather, is the foundation. If you think about a house, if you think about building a house, blockchain is the foundation, and the cryptocurrency is the house. So um, what that means is that uh, there are many types of things, or rather, let me use another example. Blockchain is the operating system, right? We all have laptops, we all have mobiles and device, mobile devices and stuff. Think about blockchain as the operating system and cryptocurrency as just one app that has been developed for and on top and, and that operates and runs on top of that operating system. What that means is that for all intents and purposes, there are many other types of applications that can be built, deployed, operated, and run on 
again, the operating system that blockchain is. So cryptocurrency just happened to get a lot of public attention because it was the first publicly propagated, the first publicly renowned instance or application of blockchain as a general technology, okay? But cryptocurrency is by no means equal to blockchain. If anything at all, cryptocurrency would be one member of the family of possible blockchain applications. And you will see in the following slides how people have deployed blockchain creatively to healthcare, integration, identity management, finance, uh, cross-border remittances, all sorts of scenarios. You know, so uh, just to prove the point that blockchain is not equal to cryptocurrency. All right, uh, we've covered that. Um, now let's talk about business, business blockchains. Um, and the word business blockchains, you know, implies that the term business, block, business blockchains implies that there is a category of blockchains that are not optimized for business. Essentially, again, if you think about the history of how we got to where we are today, blockchains started, the first blockchain, the first public blockchain, the first pub, publicly known blockchain was a cryptocurrency, the Bitcoin, the, the most popular one, Bitcoin, okay? And so many times when people speak today, they still speak about block, blockchain in the context of Bitcoin. However, over the years, people have studied the characteristics, the parameters, the attributes of that particular instance, the Bitcoin and the cryptocurrency family. And they've seen that hmm, there are certain attributes that we like, okay, that could be useful in other scenarios. And there are certain other attributes that may not be useful in this scenario. So we saw a gradual evolution of the blockchain landscape from purely permissionless public blockchains to something called private blockchains, which are closed ecosystems, unlike the public open ecosystems of, of, of cryptocurrency. And then nowadays we have something called a hybrid, okay, which is somewhere in between, you know, middle of the road solution. Uh, what, what that has meant is that when people find, like I said earlier, when people find situations where those three conditions, one, a community ecosystem, two, mutual distrust, and three, a need to have a, an authoritative, sacrosanct, immutable uh, log of transactions, what has happened is that people have discovered that it is not all the time that it is useful to make all of the information publicly available. So take a medical health records system, for instance, right? In any city of the world where you live in, it is easy to imagine that it should be easy for you as a patient who wants to walk into any hospital to have access to your, or rather to grant access to your personal medical records to the attending physician or medical professional. Um, if you think about it, if there was no way to protect your privacy, even though it was on the privacy of your medical records, right? Even though it was on a blockchain of participating medical institutions and organizations, you know, carrying out medical operations, uh, sorry, medical, you know, medical and medical related operations. Um, is that, does that therefore mean that blockchain cannot be useful to us? Because before business blockchains came about, the only types of blockchains were blockchains where all of the information is publicly available. Anybody can join, anybody can contribute, anybody can create a node, anybody can, you know, you know set up a node and join the network. But in this instance now, should anybody, technically speaking, claim to be a hospital and join that network that contains your private medical histories without some kind of scrutiny? I don't think so. And there, and, 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 and there comes, and there lies the point I'm trying to make that there are certain scenarios in our everyday lives. Talk about medical histories, talk about finance, talk about uh, identities across borders, uh, visa, our, our immigration uh, histories and stuff like that. There are certain scenarios in our, in, our, in our modern societies and our modern lives where it is useful to have the 
the benefits of a blockchain because it gives you an immutable history, but it is also useful to have some degree of censorship and or scrutiny to a, to, to a, to a minimal degree, not 100% not censorship that goes back to the days of centralized uh, 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 database systems, but something that helps us validate that the players in this particular space are people that are validated and verified to be authentic players. Imagine that it's the, imagine that we built a medical systems blockchain that connects pharmacies, uh, hospitals, uh, HMOs, insurance, insurance, health insurance providers, and, and, and all the other players in that space. And we made it open to anybody to join. It means that over time, we will have authentic as well as unauthentic hospitals, authentic as well as unauthentic pharmacies, and, 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 and and so on and so forth. So that's the, that's, that's the point that is being made here for business blockchains. So business blockchains came out of the valid realization that there are, there are closed systems that need to be operated as closed systems. We want to leverage certain advantages of blockchain. Um, and the early adopter industries were the financial services, supply chain, and healthcare. Financial services, we're all, we're all familiar with that. You know, uh, We need the banks to work together. You need to be able to carry your identity from bank to bank all over the world today. It sounds like a no brainer, but all over the world today, not just in Nigeria, not just in Africa. Whenever you want to open a new bank account with any particular bank or financial services provider, you need to do something called KYC. You need to start to create your own profile afresh with that new bank, despite the fact that you have a 20 year banking history with bank B. You know, and that's and that just sounds and that just sounds like a like like a no-brainer. Of course, there are a few you see in the in the in the in the coming slides that there are a few innovators that have started to address this particular problem. You know, but uh, uh, that's it. Supply chain, supply chain. One of the biggest challenges with supply chain is provenance, the the the, the assurance that the good that you are looking at at the retail level at the at the retail end of the chain. Uh, that started from either the manufacturer or the raw materials producer or supplier is actually what was claimed to have been sent. So people have come up also with innovative creative approaches to introduce a degree of assurance into that process that allows people to trust the movement or the journey of goods all the way from sometimes from the manufacturer to the retail shelf or sometimes all the way from the raw materials, raw materials a processing, you know, plant or factory, all the way through the manufacturer, through all the all, all the nodes, all the steps in the chain that go to the final retail shelf. And, and if you think about supply chain, there's food supply chain, there's pharma supply, pharmaceutical supply chain, there's diamonds and mineral supply chain. It's a really, really big industry, and blockchain has really, really proven to be useful in that in those regards. Healthcare as well. I've, I've, I mean, I've been using healthcare all morning, so uh, uh, the value is clear. All right, um, blockchain. Now, I, I've been asking a question in my LinkedIn posts, you know, uh, which is to say, and that question is, what really, really is the hype around blockchain, right? Is it really just hype or is it really some kind of revolutionary technology? Um, the, the answer to that is blockchain has been compared, you know, has been seen as a parallel to the, in, the introduction of blockchain in recent times, you know, in the last five to, se five to seven years, five to 10 years, has been seen to be a, a, a close parallel or very, very similar to the introduction of the early web back in the days, back in the, back in the early 90s. And what that, what, what that means is that we all are living in 2020 today. We, are, we, we all are familiar with the current version, the 2020 version of the World Wide Web. If we, if we didn't make it to 2020, and we were alive in, you know, you know, if we had asked ourselves in 1995 that, can you imagine that this would be possible or the web would be so interwoven into global human society by the year 2020? Do you think that any of us would believe that alternative reality or that, or that fictional statement? Most likely many of us would not believe it. 
and that's the that's 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 the that's a similar scenario to how blockchain is. A lot of people are saying, how can you say that blockchain can be so groundbreaking, so revolutionary that it will be the new business communication protocol? It will be the name. It will be the standard for business uh, our, uh, our protocols and communications and transactions. Essentially, essentially, the same questions were asked of the early web. You know, but look at what the the internet and the web have done to 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 modern human societies and modern human life. So, um, um, of course, it's a long journey. So, um, some of us may be familiar with it's what some of us may be familiar with what is called the hype cycle. So, of course, there will be some along this twenty to fifty year journey of full maturity. There will be some periods of rapid adoption. There will be other troughs, right? Uh, 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 you know, along that journey. But overall, if you take the overall journey, we will discover that blockchain has come to stay. And as we've seen, as we're going to see with many of the use cases that in the coming slides, blockchain is here to add value to so, so many more sectors. And it can only continue to increase in adoption. All right. So Hyperledger, right? So, so our, our conversation is slightly um, dovetailing or narrowing or streamlining, getting more streamlined. We started with D DLTs, distributed ledger technologies and blockchains generally. We filtered out that permis permissionless and or public blockchains, AKA cryptocurrencies, the most popular of which is Bitcoin, were useful in that era, in that early era of blockchains when all that was needed was to create an open network where everybody can join, everybody can be an equal participant. What we've done, what has, what has happened nowadays is that we've, uh, there's now the introduction at, and, and Hyperledger sits in this category of a new category of blockchain businesses or blockchain products or blockchain systems where people are, players rather, are unequal in their participation in that space because if you think about the, again, let's use the healthcare or the medical services um, example. Every, every participant in that player is not an equal participant. The, the place of a patient is not equal to the place of a, of a doctor or a physician or a nurse, and it's not equal to the place of a pharmacist or a pharmacy, and so on and so forth. So uh, 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 those are the considerations. Now, among many business blockchain families or frameworks or uh, you know, families, if I can use that word, Hyperledger is one of them. Uh, and this is where I will come in with my own personal comments. Hyperledger is my personal favorite because it is that particular framework that gives you the shortest time to get up and running with a practical, usable proof of concept. So you have, I've mentioned a few startup ideas. You have a startup idea to solve the insurance claims management problem, right? You can be up and running in 24 to 48 hours if you come and take one of the many production status, production uh, ready Hyperledger frameworks. Unlike other business blockchain frameworks that are not yet that mature. So Hyperledger offers the entire community around the world the opportunity to quickly, two things. One, maturity of, of framework, and you've seen the depth of technical expertise that many of the earlier speakers have demonstrated. Maturity of the framework in terms of technical depth, as well as the speed of quick um, deployment to quick demonstrated proof of concept. So you have a new supply chain um, concept you know, or idea for your particular use case, your country, your, your continent, your region, and you think, Oh my God, how am I going to get a blockchain expert to help me do this? Come over to Hyperledger, we will help you put up a quick POC in, 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 in 24 to 48 hours, and you will have something that validates your concept. You can use that POC to, 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 to secure partnerships, raise funds, and then you can start to you know, um, come back and do a proper build for, for, the, for the system. So uh, that's where Hyper, Hyperledger, as, as, a, as a particular organization comes comes in. Now, uh, it's a consortium. I won't go over all of that too much uh, because I just want to. The vision, again, the 50 year plus vision is to change the way business is conducted and, and change the way transactions are distributed across industries. All right. 
uh, what's the current momentum? Hyperledger currently, despite being just four years old, is currently has 16 projects in the, in the you see a diagram shortly that puts everything in the visual format. Uh, out, of, out, of, out of the 16 projects, five of them are production, are currently in production at production level. So um, one of those five is Hyperledger Fabric. That's the one you've heard everybody mention. Everybody that's presented today and that presented last year, at least mentioned Fabric in addition to others, to, to, to other frameworks. So Hyperledger is the most mature, mature, excuse me, because it is the most advanced. It was the first uh, framework to be developed and it has the most uh, community support. So Hyperledger is cur currently at, I think, 2.2.1, but at least you know, that's a 2.0 production release. There are, if, there are a few others that are chasing Hyperledger hot on its heels. Uh, there's Sawtooth, there's Besu, there's Bro, uh, from the fourth one now. And they are all also in production. They are not in beta, they are not in alpha, they are in production. So they are also useful in production environments. Some of them are tailored towards specific industries. Like we know that Indy, thank you, Indy has been particularly designed for identity management framework. So in a country like Nigeria, my country, where we are still uh, uh, significantly challenged with identity management problems. Hyperledger Indie is a no-brainer for us. Uh, Hyperledger Sawtooth is a no-brainer for anybody that wants to go into the supply chain industry. You know, uh, Fabric is more generic and it can do just as well, you know, on any of those, any of those uh, 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 situations. The training and certification parts there, uh, as at this time last year, I think we had only one or two training and certification courses uh, relating to Hyperledger. This is, uh, as of right now, we have nine uh, and they are available on the website, hyperledger.org. Uh, 16 active working community groups and special interest groups. SIG stands for special interest groups. So special interest groups are things like the trade finance special interest group, where they think about all the problems and around the global trade finance industry and how to bring business blockchains, especially hyperledger into that space. 170 plus stops worldwide and so on and so forth. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, these are, thank you. This is the diagram that I was talking about earlier. So we have uh, distributed ledgers. So in this, in this, in this if, if we think of Hyperledger again, like I said, as a family of frameworks and tools, okay, a community of business blockchain expertise and tools to use to deploy that expertise, then there, there are some major categories or some major buckets, right? There's a distributed ledger category of buckets where you have, like, like we said, uh, Fabric is a poster child, it's a favorite child of the, of the family. Uh, there's Bisco, there's Boro, there's Indy, Iroha, Sotu. These are the ledgers. So these are the main frameworks that operators will interact with on a normal day. These are the frameworks that will be deployed by each member of the, of the specific network, whether it's a medical services network, a healthcare network, or it's a financial services network, or a supply chain network. Then there are libraries, which are like, which are like foundational, reusable plug and play modules that are utilized by all these distributed ledgers, okay? So think about, uh, well, it's a, it's a common concept to technical people, to software engineers and architects, but you know, when you have reusable modules, so we found, people have found when they were building these particular different distributed ledgers that fabric, has certain common modules and functionality that Indy, Iroha, and Sawtooth also have. Hmm, why not abstract it out? Why not pull it out and create a reusable package for it so that whenever Fabric needs it, Fabric can call it. Whenever Indy needs it, Indy can call it. Whenever Buru needs it, Buru can call it. And that's what the library section is. The tool section are like, has just been explained by the, the by the, by, by the wonderful lady and gentleman that presented on Caliper and Explorer are tools that help you manage your instance or your deployment. So you have a production deployment of Fabric, for instance. Explorer helps you visualize the health parameters. Is it, you know, you know what are the, how many nodes do you have? What is the status of each node? Is it up, is it down? Just in a visual format, rather than having to go through this typical command line, uh, slightly less unfriendly uh, format and so on and so forth. So that's what that is. Um, we can pick them in, in, in focus. Hyperledger, like you can see, the status is active. Uh, the code base is passing. We're currently at 2.2. Uh, 
uh, styles. And important to know, Fabric is growing in such popularity, has grown in such popularity that Fabric is available as an offering because it's open source and it's free. It's available as an offering on all of the listed, listed cloud providers, AWS, uh, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, Tencent, Baidu, Oracle, SAP, IBM, Huawei, Alibaba, Hitachi Cloud is there. I know that they do have it. You know, so there are quite a number of cloud providers that have a working available instance for anybody to just go and you know try their hands out, deploy a product, deploy a test network or a, a, a pilot, a proof of concept network, and and can take it from there. Uh, Sawtooth is also growing in popularity. Indie uh, specifically designed for identity management applications. Borrow designed specifically for uh, the Ethereum virtual machine. So it's something like a bridge between the Hyperledger family and the Ethereum family, which Bitcoin and other public permissionless frameworks uh, fall into. Uh, business blockchain, Roha, Besu, and these are the libraries that I mentioned earlier. And these are the tools. All right. So more important, uh, the focus of my presentation is not on the technicals, but on the use cases, and which is what we're about to describe. So, um, excuse me. Uh, so industry use cases, uh, cross-border payments, right? Um, there's this collaboration by ANZ, BNP Paribas, BNY Mellon, SWIFT, the popular SWIFT, right? And Wells Fargo. Essentially, if you think about it, right now, if, my brother in Chicago wants to send money to me or want to send money, so I'm in Lagos, Nigeria. My brother in Chicago wants to send money to me or I want to send money to my cousin in London. Um, I need to worry about a lot of things. I need to think about what's the current exchange rate. I need to think about uh, what days are the specific uh, conversion windows open and all sorts of complexities. Uh, you know, some people have come together to try and fix those market frictions, smoothen those market frictions by providing a solution that can uh, smoothen the process of transferring money across international borders, reducing the time and money spent in the process, reduce the transaction fees and reduce the time of delivery. Right. Um, healthcare records, I've spoken about that quite a lot and people are creating, you know, um, healthcare networks especially around jurisdictions. So I know that in the United States, for instance, there's a national health insurance scheme that connects many providers together. You know, that's, that's already a natural blockchain ecosystem, just waiting for somebody to deploy it. Um, if you come to Nigeria, for instance, we also have something similar. It's called the, NA, uh, called the HMOs, uh, where we have some kind of system like that. So it's, you know, it's a natural no-brainer to do that. Uh, Interstate medical license, this is specific to the US, seafood supply chain traceability. So I mentioned earlier when I was talking about supply chains that uh, it's possible to track uh, things, many things along that journey. In this particular case, some people have attached IoT sensors. So this is a combination of blockchain and IoT, two emerging technologies, in to try and um, improve the visibility right, of fish. So if you are in Europe, somewhere in Europe, say Paris, or somewhere where you are ethically, you, where you are conscious about the ethics of how that fish that was just served on your plate arrived on your plate, then you can download, you know, uh, 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 some kind of apps, you know, where someone can provide you the traceability of that. Similar things have been done for coffee. Uh, similar things have been done for uh, many other products, dairy products. I've seen some for dairy products. Uh, you know, you can contact the Hyperledger. There's a, there's a Hyperledger use case library on the website, hyperledger.org. And, uh, you know, you can see many of these use cases in Diamond Supply Chain. Again, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> anybody that is, you know, just scantily familiar with the process of uh, the diamond supply chain knows that you need some kind of innovation. In fact, many innovations, you know, blockchain inclusive. So uh, that's also mentioned there. And then digital identity. So we mentioned this. Uh, I also know that uh, one of our uh, one of our hyperledger coordinators uh, in Kenya, Mr. Eddie Cargo, has a digital identity product. I think it's called Quilly, uh, that that also leverages Indie hyperledger Indie, I believe, 
uh, he built that on Indy and worked, you know, so but that's ready for investment or deployment. Real estate transactions, you know, uh, as well. Music and media rights. I'm particularly passionate about this uh, because I have interest in something uh, that, is, that is going in this direction. And, you know, that's just it. If you think about it, how do you establish that someone's claim on a particular piece of music property is valid or invalid? Right now, the process involves uh, combing through unbelievably huge amounts of audio files, audio histories over the past 60 years. And then sometimes those laws are different per jurisdiction. So laws may be strong, music and intellectual property strong, rights may be strong in the US, they may not be strong in Lagos, Nigeria, they may not be strong in, 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 in Bangladesh, you know, or somewhere like that. So, so uh, you, you know, that's space needs innovation, All right? Uh, that's that. Green assets management as well, letters of credit, uh, food trust, similar to the fish, fish supply chain and digital trade as well. So those are the global use cases. Um, and you know, there are a few others, uh, but I'll just run through them because uh, we're, 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 we're far spent for time. Uh, but I guess, I think that I've answered the major non-technical questions around one, is Hyperledger just hype, right? <clears throat> Hyperledger has progressed beyond hype. It, it's, it is not hype, okay, I think I've answered that. Two, um, how exactly is it useful for everyday life? So, 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 so if you step into the Hyperledger community, you may, be, you may be lost, you know, in the sea of technical jargon that is being mentioned, but just relax. Uh, there, there are people like us who can help you bridge between the techies and the, and, and the non-techies. And we can help you see the value, the business value of what you need to uh, deploy. Uh, so, so that, you know, there are so many things. This presentation will also be available uh, uh, through Mr. Aaron, the convener of this uh, conference. They'll, they'll be available after the conference so you can review them and uh, you can review the slides and take away what you need. Just, you know, uh, uh, Explorer was just mentioned. Uh, these are some of the these are some of the projects that are still in the Hyperledger labs, which is our experimentation, quote unquote, incubator for new upcoming projects. So every, each of the current um, Hyperledger projects that is, current in, that is currently in production status was, was at, once, at one time in the, in the labs because it was being incubated. And then after some time, it passed the checklist to graduate it to a full status, full blown project status. And you know, these guys hopefully will also graduate out of the labs into the mainstream sometime in the near future. Uh, a lot of blockchain showcases, like I said, many of the world leading organizations are members of the Hyperledger organization from IBM to Oracle to JP Morgan to Hitachi. You know, you've seen some of them on the screen already. Thank you very much. And that is my slide. Last point. Um, because just as an offshoot of the increasing adoption of hyperledger, as we've seen across many industries, across many use cases, just as an offshoot of that increased adoption, the natural consequence is that job openings that require hyperledger expertise are opening up everywhere. Okay, so that presents opportunities for anyone that you know would would, would like to cash in on this to so get yourself certified. Uh, 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 there's a link at the bottom of the screen that shows you where you can access training materials and certification information. And there's also something called the Hyperledger St Tech Study Circle, which is a meetup that meets weekly to review uh, knowledge and examination preparation materials. So if you're interested in becoming a Hyperledger professional and you want some kind of certification, there's a Hyperledger Certified Fabric Administrator, there's a Hyperledger Certified Sawtooth Administrator, and then there are all of these training courses that are available on the Hyperledger website slash resources slash training where you can access that information. And that's me. Thank you very much. Um, thank Thanks, you. Thanks, So there are actually two questions. Would you like to take them up on the Q&A yes. portal? Yes, please. So uh, it's, the first question asks, in the use case you, which you shared on insurance, was this a, a production one or it's still a proposition? Okay, so so that particular one in uh, so I should two 
two scenarios. One is a use case that is that is in proof of concept in Sacramento, California. And then I shared a, a, a fictional scenario that is still, that is closer home to me and, and, and possibly African because of what just happened in Lagos uh, a few weeks ago. So the one in Sacramento, California is proof of concept. The one with the farmer, the, the farmer and the extreme weather conditions. Got it. And there is awesome. one more question. What are your thoughts on using time series database versus blockchain? Do you think blockchain can reach a point where rate of transactions are comparable to popular databases? It's basically mm -hmm. asking around the scalability aspect probably. I understand. Well, I think that with modern, with the state of modern technology architecture, it's kind of a no brainer that scale is no longer a problem. And I'll explain. Uh, because pretty much every application, uh, I could hazard a guess and say 90% plus of applications, just a guess, you know, just off the top of my head, of application of modern applications are built on the cloud. What that means is where traditionally scale was a problem because it meant that you needed to procure additional physical resources, either in terms of memory, hard, uh, 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 hard drive space, RAM, or some other type of you know, network uh, uh, capacity. Nowadays, you don't really worry about those technical, physical technical considerations anymore. You outsource those things to the cloud. So um, the, the, the potential to scale any application to unlimited levels automatically, Hyperledger auto, blockchains automatically inherit that ability by also if they are implemented on the cloud. So if your use case does not prohibit you from implementing it on the cloud, because, that, because I understand that there are certain use cases, some of them regulatory, that will prevent certain people from uploading certain or hosting certain information on the cloud, then I think that using the cloud would be a way to ensure or assure that going into the future, the application itself never scales. That's the, that's the high level generic answer to that question. In terms of specifics, I don't think so. I think that depending on the efficiency of the specific business logic that is implemented. Remember we mentioned that smart contracts are the implementation of business logic in, in individual networks. Uh, depending on the specific, um, excuse me, depending on the specific business logic, depending on the specific algorithms that are built to handle the business logic, uh, it, should be, it should be easy to optimize those algorithms for scale. Thank you very much. Thanks, Edo. Um, thank, you for, thank you for the presentation. And with this, we come to end of today's session. And for all the attendees, next week, we won't be having a session. So this is a week of festival for in, in India. So happy Deepali to everyone in advance. We hope to celebrate uh, Tech Fest the coming week, which is on 21st November. So once you celebrate the festival, let's join back and let's celebrate the technology festival again on 21st. We'll, on 21st, we'll be having a continued session on blockchain automation framework with a demo. And then we will have a session on mini fabric that's a tool which we can use to set up a network on our machine and quickly set it up, test out things, uh, write chain code and, and do all that kind of things. And along with that, we'll also have a topic on identity. Um, how do we write a, a client? Like for example, how do I use Hyperledger Aries and build a solution for identity use case? And we hope to welcome you and seeing you on 21st November. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you all. Let's